Hey, I'm Saskia, and I'm a college student. I live with my roomie, Ellie. She's fun at times, but other times, she can be super serious. Also, more often than not, it feels like she's completely attached to her annoying boyfriend, Brett, as I'm always walking in on them kissing. So gross. But thanks to them, I got the chance to be around my crush. Then I myself somehow ruined it. I love rom-coms. Like, really love them. So naturally, when this amazing-looking rom-com hit the cinemas, I wanted to see it on its release date. At first, Ellie agreed to go and see it with me, but then the day before, she cancelled on me. This made me mad, as she'd promised me. So I trailed after her around our house and kept on nagging her about it while she was trying to cook, study, and talk on the phone to Brett. All of my nagging paid off, as she eventually caved and agreed to come but only on the condition that Brett came to. This sucked, as I didn't like him to be there at all. Besides, I didn't want to play Gooseberry to these two. I mean, talk about awkward. I moaned at her for ruining our girls' night and told her she was a lame friend. Then she suggested that Brett's friend Trent could come too. Trent would go. He's my pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I mean, cuteness level? 10 out of 10. I have already seen him a couple of times at school and secretly admired him, though she didn't know about it. I was so excited about meeting Trent properly, so I spent ages doing my hair and makeup, and I put on this really cute dress. Probably that was the longest duration I spent in front of the mirror in my entire life. I wanted to impress him. Then maybe he could become my boyfriend, and I'd have my very own happy ending. Ellie and I showed up at the theater before them. Time ticked by and I remained glued to the entrance. When it comes to plans, I'm always the punctual one. I hate it when someone's late. I mean, it's not hard to be on time. Jeez, they were almost half an hour late. What's wrong with them? I was mad, super mad. Anger built up inside of me. I'm surprised steam didn't come out of my ears. But then, suddenly, Brett and Trent walked through the entrance, and just a second, all my anger vanished. Trent was wearing a navy shirt, my fave color, and looking so damn hot. My anger instantly melted, and I found myself smiling over at him. He said, Sorry we're late. It's the traffic, and when we were coming. Before he could complete, I blurted out, It's okay. Ellie gave me a strange look, and was about to say something, but I hit her arm to stop her. She knew how much lateness bugged me. The boys mentioned they were hungry, so we went to get food. I was so hungry, my stomach was gurgling, but I didn't want to look greedy in front of him. The two lovebirds walked holding hands in front, leaving us behind. We walked in silence. I wanted to talk and not miss a chance to stare at his face, but as I didn't want to appear desperate, I chose to keep quiet. Just then, my stomach gurgled really loudly, but he acted like he hadn't heard. He was so sweet. Everyone else ordered puffs but have you tried eating those without spreading them all over your lip? I was trying to impress Trent, not scare him off. So to stay on the safe side, I ordered the potato bhaji, and I only ate two, although I'm a big foodie. During the movie, Ellie and Brett occupied the corner seats, so I sat next to Mr. Cutie. The movie started, and they got into action. I was not eavesdropping, but I couldn't help but hear some weird noises coming from them. Trent smiled at me. I guess he heard them too. O-M-G. His dimples! You know, I have a thing for dimples. He looked even more handsome in the dim lights. Whenever a romantic scene came, I pictured me and him. I knew I had to slow down, but I couldn't. Everything was going well, when suddenly, a very bad smell crawled into my nose. It was not bad, but disgusting. Worse than a rotten egg. Yeah, it was the smell of a fart. Our row had only four seats, and it was evident that someone among us had done the crime. It was so embarrassing. Worse still, my eyes teared up due to the stench. We all passed weird glances between us. Then Ellie said, be frank. Who dealt it? I replied, accept it, Yar. I know who it is. She replied, what is the proof? And I said, you're always doing it at home. She blushed bright red, and Brett laughed out loud. I never miss a chance to embarrass her. Little did I know, I had to pay such a huge price for this. 
She grinned at me, then said, Well, everyone knows who ate potatoes today. Talk about embarrassing. Everyone, except me, obviously, laughed. And out of them all, Trent was the one who laughed the most. For the rest of the movie, Trent would look at me and laugh. Even more annoyingly, the fart culprit remained a mystery. Then, when we were on the way out of the cinema, I dropped my lipstick on the floor and had to bend down to pick it up. A big fart came out from me! Everyone in this world could hear it. And yep, including Trent, who was standing right behind me. They all laughed, and I just stood there, mortified. Worse still, they must think that the previous fart belonged to me too. But no! My fart didn't even have a smell. It was just like fresh air and could be totally normal with no realization if it didn't sound like a bomb. That was the most awkward moment in my entire life. There was no way Trent would like me now. This sucked. As soon as I got home, I rushed up to my room and stayed there. I didn't want to see Ellie all smug. I didn't want to see anyone ever again. That night, I just lay on my bed and stared at the ceiling, concerned about how my life would go. Due to a nonsense fart, my crush had laughed at me, probably now hated me, and thought I was a loser. Now we could never be in a relationship together, or marry and have kids. Talk about a life ruiner! I'd end up some crazy cat lady, or even worse, stuck with this weird nerd in my college called Carson, the only person in this world who could ever like me. A message suddenly came. My heart flipped. It was from Trent. Is your stomach okay? This was so embarrassing. Would I ever live it down? It's not funny, smiley face, I messaged back. Then, to my surprise, he replied with, I just want to ask you out tomorrow. I have two tickets. It's a horror movie. Oh, damn. Not the cinema again. Was this a joke? Was he trying to humiliate me again? The cinema staff would remember my face, as I was the girl who created a bomb fart that everyone in the vicinity heard. I made up some excuse about having to study. This sucked, as it was a horror movie, and I know I just missed the chance to be a little weak cat in his arms, but what else could I do? To back up my story, I spent Saturday in the library. Yes, I know, talk about lame. This was so awful. It was a sunny day, but for sure, I had to pretend like I was super busy on something, in case him and my roomie ever talked and found out that I was just wrapping myself in my blanket feeling ashamed about my two farts. I sat down and flicked through a book, when Carson came and sat next to me. Yep, the nerd. He smiled at me, and I didn't want to be rude, so I smiled back. Suddenly, I heard a voice. So here you are. Crazy busy with another guy? It was Mr. Cutie himself, Trent. Turns out, he'd shown up with lunch and a coffee for me. I tried explaining to him that I didn't even know Carson that well. That's when Carson smiled over at me, grabbed my hand, then said, We spend every Saturday together at the library, and now we're official. I sat there, frozen. This was madness. By the time I realized Carson was still holding my hand and pulled it away, it was too late, as Trent had stormed off. Then, messages continuously popped up from my friends. You're with Carson? You guys are dating in the library? Seriously? I saw your picture. Carson the nerd posted it on Instagram with, studying on Saturday with my love. I checked my social media. Yep, Carson had just tagged me in a post with him. Now, as well as being the fart girl, Trent now also thinks I'm some sort of lying floozy. This is so not the case. I just want my happily ever after with him. Now what am I meant to do? Hey, it's Saskia, back again to tell you all about my not-so-successful love life. It started during a movie trip with my roomie Ellie, her annoying boyfriend Brett, and his dreamy friend Trent. Swoon! During the movie, someone let out a huge fart, and I ended up being blamed for it. Then, to make it worse, on leaving the cinema, I actually did fart, in front of everyone. I thought I'd blown it with Trent, literally. So when he asked me out on a date, my embarrassment made me turn him down, and instead, I went to the library to study. 
Only while I was there, Trent appeared and saw me with my classmate Carson and came to the wrong conclusion. Worse still, now Carson seems to like me. Now my life's a mess and Trent isn't talking to me. So after an evening spent watching way too many cheesy romance films and consuming far too much ice cream, I realized that my self-pity parade wasn't the answer. I mean, talk about tragedy. I just couldn't hide away. No, I had to hold my head up high and be as resilient as the characters from my favorite rom-coms were. So the next day at college, I forced myself to look nice and smile as I trailed after Ellie and Brett. Ugh. Seeing as Brett was friends with Trent, I thought it'd be easier to get Brett to explain to him that nothing was going on between me and Carson. Why don't you tell him yourself? Brett rolled his eyes. No, I wasn't going to tell him that. I was too nervous to meet him. Why do I have to explain to him directly? You just act like I care about him. I blurted out to cover my embarrassment. And at that very moment, Trent appeared from nowhere. His uncomfortable face made it known that he'd heard everything. Then Brett smirked and said, Looks like I don't have to explain about Carson to Trent anymore. But would you like me to explain with him about your big loud fart the other night? I stood there mortified. I knew Brett was a jerk, but did he really have to bring the fart situation up now? Now everyone was looking at me like I was a comedian. For the rest of the day, I tried to keep a low key. This was all Carson's fault. Why did he have to act like we were a couple? I needed to find him and tell him straight out that he was delusional. Only, I couldn't find him in class, the library, or anywhere else in college. So following Ellie's suggestion, at my lunchtime in the canteen, I messaged him saying, Why did you say all that stuff? After a while, he answered, I want to impress you, because I think that I kind of like you. He's gotta be kidding me! I spoke out loud at the same time as I stood up from my seat, without recalling that I was in the middle of a busy canteen. Oh, great. Now people looked at me like a weird person. Again, just in one day. I wanted to yell out, Nope! People, you've all got the wrong idea. The weird person here isn't me! It's the guy texting me right now! But getting back to reality, I sat down and mumbled sorry to everyone for my extra behavior. For real, if you like me, you should pursue me in the right way. Don't do such silly things like that. I wrote back. I thought that would be the end of it. Oh, how wrong I was. The messages from Carson didn't end. Instead, he bombarded me with questions, such as what's my favorite hobby? My favorite color? Food I liked? At first, I ignored the messages. But then he messaged me. I just want to be friends and learn more about you as I truly care about you. If you want me to stop, then I will. Okay, so I felt kind of bad for him. As needy as Carson could be, he was a nice enough guy who didn't deserve the silent treatment, so I began messaging him back. And with Trent, things between us were terrible anyway. He basically acted like I didn't exist, and whenever he hung out with the others and I, he just scrolled through his phone so he didn't have to make eye contact with me. Talk about annoying! One day, tension between us even worsened. That time, I was sitting on the college lawn with the three of them, Trent, Brett, and Ellie, and Trent was ignoring me as usual, when out of nowhere, a girl appeared and angrily approached us. We all looked at Brett, as, let's face it, out of all of us, he was the most likely to mess up. But then the girl yelled at me. You're a bad person, Saskia. You stole Carson from me. She also added that she used to be Carson's girlfriend, but not anymore because Carson liked me. Ugh! What was going on? I didn't like Carson, I said, but she was assertive that her Carson was too good to reject, except that I had a boyfriend already. Before I had a chance to think up a reply, Brett said, besides Carson, who else can like Saskia? <laughs> right, Brett and his rude comment again, which made me want to kick him straight to the ground. I snapped back at him. For your information, there is a very handsome guy chasing me, and maybe someday I will accept him. As I finished speaking, I was startled as Trent suddenly stormed off. OMG! That was so terrible! Now Trent thought I had someone else! Ugh! Why was my life such a mess? Then, to make it worse, about one week later, I walked out of class to see this pretty girl in the hall called Amy. She was flirting with Trent. Right in front of my eyes! Jeez! Why were there so many people interfering with our love story? Ellie and Brett, who had no sensitivity about my feelings, adding the mess Carson and his ex left to me, now a girl wanted to steal Trent? Clearly, if it wasn't me, no one could help us. I needed to talk to Trent, without actually talking to him, as I sucked at doing this. So, taking inspiration from the genre of love, I decided to write a soppy letter. Yeah, you may say it's old-fashioned, but 
I say it's romantic. I was so absorbed in thought while I was walking to the lecture that I bumped into someone and dropped the letter in my hand. It was Amy, and she helped me pick it up. She saw Trent's name, and even a heart sign beside it. Cringe. Then she looked at me for a moment and said, I feel sorry for you, but I have to tell you that Trent has a girlfriend. What? I'm sure my heart actually sunk. Amy told me that she'd asked Trent out, and he'd turned her down because he liked someone else. I pictured Trent being all lovey-dovey with some other girl, and it made me feel so jealous. Naturally, I couldn't face my next lecture, so I skipped it and went home, with my undelivered love letter stuffed to the bottom of my bag. Later on that night, I went for a long walk to clear my head. That's when Carson messaged me. Why didn't you tell me that you have someone else? Why choose him? Why not me? Clearly, Carson's crazy ex had told him what I said. I wasn't in the mood for his messages right now. He'd caused me enough trouble. So I sent a clear message about my feelings. I lied. There's no other guy. Actually, I have one-sided feelings for Trent. I'm sorry. Carson didn't reply to me after that. Then Ellie called me, insisting I come to a party. Brett even yelled on the phone that I had to come because they were too wasted. It wasn't like I had anything better to do, so I searched for the location Ellie sent me. As soon as I was at the front of the house, I felt so confused. As the house seemed too quiet for a party, had Ellie sent me the wrong location? I mean, she didn't sound super drunk. Then the door opened. OMG. It was Trent! He walked out and asked me to follow him inside. The lighting was very dim, and no one was here. He took me to the middle of the kitchen, where I saw a small disco ball hang in the room ceiling. Suddenly, he took my hand in his hand, looked straight at me, and said the three words I never expected to hear from him. I like you. OMG. Did Trent really like me, or was I being pranked right now? My hand was trembling, and my silly thoughts even made me look around to see if anyone was hiding. But then, he grinned at me. I guess you're stunned. But you should prepare for my next confession. He told me that Carson was his childhood friend. Carson teased Trent in the library because he knew Trent's feelings for me, but he didn't expect it to backfire. And to apologize, Carson offered to help Trent pursue me. First, Trent could pretend to be Carson to text and learn more about me. Then, to escalate the process, Carson asked a friend to pretend to be his ex, forcing me to speak out my feelings. Trent was so despaired by my response, so he decided to impersonate Carson one last time and sent that message to me, where he found out that I liked him. Immediately, Trent asked Ellie and Brett to help him out. Wow, this plan was definitely not normal, but the way he nervously admitted everything to me somehow made my heart flutter. I nodded my head as a sign of me forgiving him. Thanks, he smiled back. I saw his face in the middle of the dim flickering lights approaching mine slowly. This was it. Our first kiss was going to happen. But then I heard a great big fart. What? Brett, Ellie, and Carson appeared in the front door. They were all laughing hysterically, and Brett was holding a fart machine and said, Well, it's about time you two got together. Trent shooed them off. Then smiling, he said to me, Let's try that again, shall we? I nodded, and we kissed. Talk about butterflies! And that's how I ended up with the cutest boyfriend ever. Oh, wait, hang on a minute. My story hasn't finished yet, because that night when I returned home, I received a message from Trent telling me that he was the one who made the first fart in the cinema that time. He said sorry to me, but he was too embarrassed to admit it right away. Really? This was a shocker, but also hilarious. As if our story could become so complicated just because of a very simple thing. Moreover, if that day both me and Trent farted at the cinema, wasn't that our destiny? Hi, I'm Nicole. I grew up in a small town. You know, the kind where everyone knows each other's business. Don't let my pretty appearance and feminine ways fool you, as I'm a tough cookie, but my best friend Dominique... Well, she lets people walk all over her, which really annoys me. I always went out of my way to protect her, but I never expected to lose her as a best friend. Dominique and I met way back in kindergarten. This other girl was teasing her about her pigtails, so I stormed over there and pushed her into a muddy puddle, which resulted in her running off in tears. Dominique gave me the sweetest look and shyly thanked me. After that, we became pretty much inseparable. 
we pinky promised each other that we'd always be there to protect each other, and we'd never date anyone, as boys were stupid. But then, high school happened. Dominique grew prettier and prettier, which meant lots of boys liked her. But she had the worst taste ever in boys, and she always went for guys who took advantage of her sweet nature. There was this one jerk from school called Brandon. He thought the world revolved around him just because he was okay looking and good at sports. Jeez, he was the worst. Anyway, he made sure everyone knew about the lame party he was having. Dominique and I were standing by her locker when Brandon came and talked to us. After he left, I looked at Dominique. She turned as red as a lobster. I knew that look. She clearly had a crush on him. And I, as always, had to protect her from the latest jerk. I arranged to meet Dominique at the party. I arrived to find her standing in the corner chatting to Brandon. Ugh. I hurried over to them and started talking about odd things like how beautiful the weather was. Dominique noticed my weird behavior, so she asked Brandon to get us some drinks, then asked me what was up. I said to her, why are you hanging out with this guy? Don't you know how he treats girls like you? She replied, girls like me? What's that supposed to mean? I don't need a babysitter. You can't tell me what to do. Then she walked off in a huff. Whatever, she could be that way. I was trying to protect her from a guy only after one thing. She didn't have to be so crass about it. I hung out with some of my other classmates, but continued to keep an eye on her. She barely left Brandon's side, and I noticed how he kept supplying her with drinks. When it got to the point that she nearly fell over, then giggled about it, I knew she'd drunk enough. I went over to her and told her I was taking her home. But Brandon had other ideas. He grabbed a bottle and announced that all of us were going to play spin the bottle. Ugh, could this night get any worse? Smirking, he passed me the bottle and said, Ladies first. I snatched it off him. Jeez. I hoped the bottle didn't stop on Brandon, as I would probably throw up if I had to kiss his gross lips. I spun the bottle and, I swear, it took forever to stop spinning. And then the bottle finally stopped on Dominique. O-M-G! I had to kiss her. She's my best friend. Talk about weird! Everybody was laughing and cheering, kiss, 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 kiss. We looked at each other and blushed. Then she closed her eyes and leaned towards me. I told myself that it was just some dumb game and it didn't mean anything. Before I also closed my eyes and we kissed. My heart started to beat really fast and my hands began to shake. It's so strange. I didn't feel weird at all. Actually, it felt warm and safe. We kissed for 10 seconds, but for me, it felt like five minutes. Before I could properly process what was going on, Brandon passed her the bottle. Oh no, it was her turn. She spun the bottle and it stopped on Brandon. Stupid Brandon. Oh, hell no. She has to kiss that jerk? Brandon looked like all of his Christmases had come at once. Jeez, I seriously hoped that when it was his turn, the bottle landed on a dude. He just grabbed her hand, pulled her towards him, and kissed her. I mean, really kissed her. And she kissed him back. Oh no. I thought I was going to throw up. Everybody was cheering. Well, except for me. Obviously, they wouldn't quit kissing. So I pulled him away from her and told her that that was enough. But he flinched me off and told me they were just getting started. Then he continued kissing her. Anger fueled me. So I grabbed Brandon and punched him in the face. Everyone was yelling at me, including Brandon, who made it clear I needed to leave his lame party. I looked at Dominique, but she glanced away from me. Then I saw Brandon put his arm around her shoulders. After that, I left without saying another word. I was angry, especially towards Dominique. She was my best friend, yet she chose to stay with that jerk over me. More confusingly, I couldn't stop replaying our kiss over and over in my mind. I'd dated a few guys before, but I'd never felt that way when I kissed them. With her, it felt like butterflies were in my stomach. Did I have feelings for my best friend? No way. I liked boys, right? My mood only worsened the next day at school. I was drinking coffee in the canteen when I heard some girls behind me talking about how Dominique had slept with Brandon last night. Talk about a surprise. I ended up knocking over my coffee in shock. Maybe I misheard them. So I turned around and asked the girls if it was true. And they all said yes. In that instance, 
I was just this empty vessel with no happiness left inside of me. When I saw Dominique in the corridor, she waved over at me, but I just walked away. The next few weeks were awful. I couldn't sleep, eat, or concentrate on anything. All I could think about was Dominique being with Brandon, and it made my heart hurt. I missed her smile, her laugh, and how happy she made me. Yep, I finally realized that I had feelings for my best friend, but she was in love with somebody else. I tried my best to move on, so I started dating some guy named Clay. He was kinda cute and a really nice guy. Clay was great and all, but I missed Dominique like crazy. Then one day, when Clay was round at mine studying, there was a knock at the door. To my complete shock, I opened the door to see Dominique standing there. I didn't know how to react. Part of me was so happy to see her, but she caused me so much pain. So I abruptly said, what do you want? Nicole, please hear me out. I'm so, so sorry about what happened at Brandon's party. I really miss you, and there's something else I need to tell you. I couldn't deal with this right now. I still felt so hurt, so I told her to go. Then I went into the house and left her outside. Later on, I received a message from Dominique. Dear Nicole, I'm really sorry about everything. I wasn't a good friend to you. You protected me, but I didn't appreciate it. I'm so stupid. I realize now that you are the best thing that ever happened to me. I love you, Nicole. But I get it now. We're not destined to be together. I hope Clay makes you happy. Your best friend, Dominique. Dominique loved me! She loved me too! I needed to see her right away, so I ran over to her house. But when I got there, it was like the end of the world. She wasn't there. But not only that, the house was empty. I tried calling her, but her number didn't exist anymore. Her neighbor told me Dominique's father had got a new job, so they'd all left in a hurry, and she didn't know where they'd move to. And that's it. Dominique had erased herself from my life. I didn't even have the chance to tell her how I felt. I just sat outside her empty house and cried. I broke up with Clay after that. Then, when I graduated from high school, I left the town that held so many painful memories about Dominique and moved to college in New York. After four years, I graduated and decided to stay in the city. One day, I was having my morning coffee in my favorite cafe when I saw this woman across the street. She looked so familiar. Could it be? I couldn't believe my eyes. It was her. It was Dominique. I narrowly avoided being hit by a taxi as I rushed across the street to get to her. Dominique! Is that you? I shouted. She turned and looked at me. Nicole? Oh my god. How long has it been? Five years? Then I noticed that she was holding a kid's hand. He looked around three or four years old. Is that your nephew? He's so cute, I said. Actually, no. He's my son. His name is Nick. I named him after you. It turns out before she'd left town, she'd fallen pregnant with Brandon's child. She decided to keep the baby and raised him alone with her family. And she hadn't told Brandon about him. Having her back in my life was amazing. There's no way I was losing her again. So one time when I was over at hers watching a movie, I found the courage to tell her how I felt about her. At first, she was quiet, and my heart sank at the prospect of her rejecting me. But then she smiled and told me she loved me too, and that she always had. I'm so relieved that this time around, I didn't make the same mistake that I made when I was younger. I'm so fortunate to have another chance with Dominique, and I will never let her go again. Her and Nick are my world. Our mistakes don't define us. Instead, they're there to learn from, so in the future, we're more capable of making the right choices. As soppy as it sounds, I guess true love will always prevail in the end. It definitely has for me. I got really lucky in high school. I became super close with a girl called Sadie, and we did everything together. Up until then, I'd never really had a close friend, so I couldn't believe it when we met and just clicked. People even joked we were lesbians, but our friendship wasn't like that. She just got me. I finally felt understood, and I wondered where she'd been all my life. When it was time to apply for university, of course we applied to exactly the same ones and even the same major. It was kind of funny, because when I first met Sadie, she thought biochemistry was the most boring subject in the world. 
but as soon as I told her it was what I was planning to study, she quickly changed her tune. And applied too. We didn't want to be apart, even for a second. In the first year of university, we were working on a project, and Sadie and I got teamed up with a really cute guy. His name was Jordan, and pretty soon, the three of us were like the three musketeers. We started hanging out a lot. And one night, we were in the library studying, and I couldn't stop looking at Jordan. Every time I looked up, he was looking at me. I suddenly felt so attracted to him, and it was clear that there was a lot of chemistry between us. That same night, he sent me a message telling me he liked me, and I was so happy. After that night, Jordan and I started hanging out even more. If the three of us were together, Jordan would always sit next to me, and he'd even hold my hand under the table. Clearly, we were becoming a couple, and everyone knew it, even Sadie. But she started acting weird. She always seemed to find a reason to get in between me and Jordan. One time, she was supposed to be babysitting her nephew, but when she found out Jordan and I were working together in the lab, she told her sister she was sick and couldn't babysit. And then she just stayed with us. It was actually kind of awkward, because we never got any alone time. Even when we went to the movies, Sadie would always turn up. One night, we were watching a horror movie, and she was so scared, she asked if she could sit in the middle of us. Honestly, it was starting to annoy me. I tried to talk to her about it, but she always made jokes and changed the subject. Then, things got really weird when we took a camping trip one weekend. Jordan and I had been planning it for ages, a romantic weekend away. We decided to take his motorbike, and made a joke with Sadie that the motorbike couldn't carry three on it. But you won't believe it. When we got to the campsite, she was there. She'd paid a ton of cash and taken a taxi there. Great. So now we had a third wheel the whole weekend. Don't get me wrong. Sadie was my best friend, and she was just as important to me as Jordan. But sometimes, you just want private time with your boyfriend. On that trip, I'd brought my Polaroid camera. Jordan and I took a photo together, and I kissed him on the cheek. But then, the moment he pressed the button, Sadie jumped in and kissed his other cheek. She laughed so much about it and acted like she was just joking, but I found it really odd. Then, something even more odd happened. I went to her room one night to borrow a book. Her door was open, so I just walked in, and I saw her sitting there cutting the Polaroid photo. Suddenly, everything made sense. She was obviously in love with Jordan and wanted to come between us. That's why she always turned up to ruin the moment and why she kissed his cheek. But the thing that hurt the most was that she wanted to cut me out of the photo. I'd been so good to her, like a sister, and never wanted her to feel left out. But the whole time, she'd been looking to get rid of me. That day, we had a huge fight, and I told her I couldn't believe she'd want to ruin my relationship with Jordan like this. She just stood there crying, saying she was sorry, and she couldn't help how she felt. After that, she just disappeared. I felt kind of guilty. I'd been so angry at her. But why did she have to drop out of university because of it? If only I'd been more calm about it all, maybe we'd still be friends. Jordan and I stayed together, which helped a lot. At least I still had him. In my third year of university, I won an award for my successful research on a biochemical compound, and I got to give presentations in hospitals. One time, I was at a hospital in San Fran, and I met a guy called David. He'd been sitting in the front row, and I noticed that he seemed to truly focus on my presentation. After I finished, he came up to ask me some questions. He was seriously charming, and it felt great to meet someone who really had interest in my research. After we chatted, he gave me his phone number, and then left. I don't know why, but I couldn't stop thinking about him. Obviously, I didn't tell Jordan about him, and pretty soon, David and I were talking all the time. We had so much in common, and he seemed to understand me more than Jordan did. After one month of talking to David every day, I broke up with Jordan. It wasn't fair on him, and I knew deep down I just wanted to be with David. One day, David and I were out walking, and we bumped into Jordan. Suddenly, Jordan punched David right in the face, and while the two of them were fighting, David's wallet fell out of his pocket, and straight away, I saw something familiar. It was the Polaroid photo! And then, I looked closer, 
and realized it was a photo of me and Sadie. I hadn't been cut out of it. Jordan had been. It looked like Sadie and I were kissing in the photo. But why did David have this in his wallet? I showed it to Jordan, and we were both so confused. And that's when David broke down and told us everything. David is Sadie! She'd undergone surgeries to change her gender and her appearance because she was so in love with me and just wanted to find a way for us to be together. I was so shocked. I mean, I love David, but I'd never thought about being with a trans guy before. I don't know what to do. Should I continue dating David? Even though he lied to me about everything? Job hunting is so not fun. But my current job as a waitress isn't working out. There's too much standing around. I now have a blister on my foot. Totally disgusting. Ooh, hang on. This one sounded interesting. Retired couple seeks a well-mannered female housekeeper to attend to their country estate. Board and meals included. This job sounded like such an easy ride, so I called them immediately. And yep, they invited me over. So, this is their country estate. Jeez, it's basically a castle. The owner, Mrs. Harris, answered the door. She seemed friendly enough, and she gave me a tour of the place. I expected her to interview me or something, but in the end, she just showed me a bedroom, then said, I hope this room is adequate enough for you. You'll start tomorrow. My husband and I are away from home quite often. All you have to do is keep an eye on the place and play with our son, as he does get lonely. Huh? I didn't see anything about babysitting in the job description. But I mean, come on, how bad could playing with some little kid be? And who cares? This was the perfect job. They were paying me a high salary to do practically nothing, not even cleaning or cooking, as they had many maids for that. This was over the top. Some people had way more money than cents. I needed to hurry up and move in. For the first few days, the Harrises weren't around, and I didn't see any signs of a kid. I mooched around the mansion and explored the grounds. Then one day, I was on the third floor inspecting a funny-looking portrait when I heard footsteps behind me. Startled. I turned around and saw a guy holding a teddy bear and licking a lollipop. He was looking straight at me. Okay, weird. Hello? And you are? I asked. Fred, he said, with a very childish tone. Huh? He was like almost 30 already. How come he spoke like that? Fred wants to play! He raised the teddy bear up to my face, like an invitation. All right, I shrugged, then followed him into his room. Whoa, it was like a toy store in there. He wheeled a toy truck over to me, so I took it and made car sounds as I moved it around. He clapped his hands and cheered excitedly. I ended up spending the rest of the day there playing these childish games with him. Then when I looked up, I saw Mr. and Mrs. Harris standing in the doorway, and beside them was a cameraman who was filming Fred and me. They asked to talk privately, so I followed them out to the garden. Mr. Harris started. Fred is our only son. Past traumas affected him. So now, although he appears to be an adult man, he still acts like a kid. Now that made sense. And too bad for him, though. The story continued that Mr. and Mrs. Harris used to work in the media. A few years ago, they decided to record Fred's daily activities then edited them into videos to make a weekly series on social media. Wow, a show about a man acting like a child? How strange. The audience loves watching Freddy. Mrs. Harris giggled, but then she immediately changed her tone. But I do worry they'll soon get tired of watching just him. I think he should have a friend. It will help the show, and it'll be good for Freddy as he'll feel less lonely. I wonder... She looked at me all wide-eyed. Noticing my skeptical look, Mr. Harris jumped in before I even opened my mouth. We'll pay you double. Whoa, what a deal! I mean, it's not like I needed to be an award-winning actress or anything to be in this type of videos. Most importantly, that amount of money was insane. 
Only an idiot would have turned down an offer like this, right? So I started being friends with Fred. We shared toys, played in the garden, and did all those childlike things together. To be honest, I found him really sweet, and I felt sorry for him. Whenever he saw me, he beamed at me, and usually handed me his favorite toy, and that made me feel good. So, okay, the cameraman followed us around all day, but I soon forgot he was there. And I also never check out the final videos, as I found it cringy to watch myself. Then one day, the Harris's sat me down to talk to me again. Mrs. Harris looked at me as she said, You may consider Freddy as a child, but he is now a 27-year-old man, handsome and physically healthy. He likes you, and he has every right to date. Then after showing me several comments on the internet, they told me frankly that the views would be higher if I became Fred's girlfriend. So, is it some kind of real-life fairy tale? A kind-hearted girl falls in love with a mentally disadvantaged man? Jeez. But I'm not into him that way. I groaned, pulling a wry face. Darling. She touched my arm. It would only be for the camera. And it would make Freddy so happy. And of course, you'll be generously compensated. Mr. Harris added. Oof. That much money? Who could say no? And it was only acting. Besides, Fred enjoyed making the videos. Right? They must have had millions of views for the Harrises to throw money around like this. So I quit hesitating and agreed. They handed me an improv script and told me to do exactly whatever was written in it. The more convincing my performance, the higher my salary. Oh man, not long ago, I didn't have a cent to my name. And now I had thousands of dollars in my bank account. I could go to college, get myself an apartment, etc. A bright future was ahead for me. In the first video, I sat down next to Fred, took his hand, but he immediately started a thumb war. So I gave up on the hand-holding and softly said, Fred, I love spending time with you. You're so sweet and kind, and I have feelings for you. He let out an excitable shout. Then he pretended to be an airplane and did loops around the room. The next few videos didn't get any easier. When I tried to snuggle up to him, he'd whack me with his giant teddy bear. And when I went in for a kiss on his cheek, he pressed a toy car into my face. That was why when I read the next script, in which we were going to have a romantic dinner together, I couldn't help sighing and rolling my eyes. But it was work. So I put on a pretty dress and walked into the dining room. It was decorated with flower petals on the table and there was mood lighting. Delicious? I asked while he was stuffing his face. He nodded, threw down the silverware, and clapped his hands. Fred cooks for Lynn Eats! Fred chewed as he spoke, spitting food all over. Man, this was so hilarious, I couldn't help laughing. Then he walked over to me and hugged me tightly. Oh my god, he got food stains all over my dress! <laughs> I looked straight into his eyes and thought, yeah, I did like him as a cute little brother. Poor guy. If only he wasn't so unfortunate. Suddenly, I felt his hands tightening around my waist. Stunned, I pushed him back and feigned interest in my food. A huge amount of money was transferred into my account that month, but I didn't feel so youthful anymore. So I started going off script and doing things that I thought were good for Fred. I used his toys to teach him math skills. I read him good books, and I showed him how to make cupcakes. One evening, when I was walking back to my room, Mr. Harris blocked my path, and scowling at me said, What the hell are you playing at? Did you even read this week's script? I tried pushing past him, but he grabbed my arm. You're causing our viewers to leave. I'm paying you less this month. I shook myself free of his grip and replied, Money? Is that all that matters to you? Then I rolled my eyes and returned to my room. That night, I ended up looking up the videos. In one of the older ones, Fred was in a suit and looked super uncomfortable. Every time he tried to loosen the tie or unbutton the shirt, a stick went in the frame and hit him in the butt. After a few tries, Fred threw himself on the floor and started having a tantrum. There were so many comments like, 
OMG, this is way too hilarious. And grow up, man. Or don't, for our entertainment. Oh no, people were so mean. Fred didn't choose to be like that. The Harrises were using their own son to get rich by making fun of him. Poor Fred. I had to stop this. I packed my bag, stormed into the room where the Harrises were watching TV, and said, I like Fred and still want to be his friend, but I'm not going to be part of this freak show anymore. I quit. And if you care about Fred at all, I suggest you do the same. I expected them to beg me to stay or something, but Mrs. Harris just snarked. All right then, if you want to quit, just leave. Why bother making a fuss about all this? Girls like you won't be hard to replace anyway. How ruthless were they? I was fueled with anger. So I left their dumb mansion immediately and didn't look back. And guess who is cooking in my kitchen while I'm telling you this crazy story? Yep, it's Fred. A few weeks after I left, I answered the doorbell to find Fred standing there. Crazier still, he was acting completely normal. Turns out, the Harrises were neglectful of Fred, so he was raised by an old butler, like Bruce and Alfred. When Fred was 15, his parents ended up jobless and in debt. Fred told me, I wanted their attention so badly, so I started acting like I was still a little kid. But then his cute, silly actions meant his parents came up with their crazy video idea. They lied about Fred's age since he does look a bit older then made him solo act Dumb and Dumber on camera for years. At first, I thought this would be a good way to help my parents overcome their financial difficulties. But I soon grew tired of pretending, and they had more than enough money. So I told them to stop, but they refused. Then he told me that the night I left, he got into a heated argument with his parents and told them he wasn't doing the show ever again. I don't know anyone else, and have feelings for no one else. But you, he confessed. And, whoa, turns out he's only 19. So, I let him stay with me, and, well, we started dating. Like, real romantic dates, and a real romantic grown-up relationship. I still have a lot of money in my account, and Fred took all the money he deserved from his parents, then moved in with me. I'm starting college next month, and I can't wait. Meanwhile, Fred has found an online course and is waiting for the results from the new part-time job. Also online. Well, he's gotta hide for quite a while, since his face is all over the internet. But our future together is really wide open this time. Now, excuse me, we have a dinner date to enjoy. This is a real-life fairy tale, baby. Oh, I've never been in a negotiation that lasted this long before. I've been here since three, and it's now eight. Worse still, I hadn't even mentioned the funding yet. I've tried, but it was Dane's fault. He kept on interrupting me and going off topic. As I looked at Dane, who was currently reenacting a soccer game with condiments, I wondered how on earth was he a part of the student council? He might have been a senior, but he was an average grade student who didn't seem to excel at anything. He also exaggerated everything and mainly just messed around. I should never have agreed with Dane to arrange the meeting here. Not only had I wasted five hours of my life, but it looked like the funding was a no deal. I couldn't take any more of this. Remind me never to listen to Dane ever again. I grabbed my bag and was about to stand up when Mr. Johnson turned to me. Ruth, I love your idea. Funding all of it would be a bit of a stretch, but I can go to 80%. And if it becomes a yearly thing, I'll be happy to continue sponsoring it. I stared at him open-mouthed. Did I hear him right? Mr. Johnson, the owner of the local music shop, was actually agreeing to provide a big chunk of the funding for our student talent show? By the way... I like this Dane guy. <laughs> Today's been fun. Dane wooed. Yes, it's a dealio. And enthusiastically shook Mr. Johnson's hand. Wait, 
I was supposed to be the one to close the deal. Never mind. We had the funding. This was amazing. We did it! Dane punched the air. Hey, um, how did you... He gave a Cheshire cat grin as he replied. Never expected that, did you? What do you think of me now, Ruth the new president? I shrugged and laughed. Hey, how about a celebratory hug, huh? He lunged at me with open arms. Well, why not? This deserved a celebration, after all. We were jumping up and down, and I don't know, maybe I was delirious from the stupidly long meeting or something. But the next thing I knew, we were kissing. OMG! We immediately pulled away from each other and awkwardly looked the other way. After that, he drove me home in silence. Oh no, what was I thinking? Why did I, or anyone breathing, do that? It was Dane. Dane! Can you believe it? Well, okay, I suppose it'd been a difficult couple of months for me. As soon as I became president of the student council, my boyfriend Walter didn't congratulate me. No, instead he broke up with me. We'd been together for two years, but recently he'd spoken about marriage and buying a house. Um, not yet. I want to focus on my career first. But I guess me applying to the student's council and being all busy bee with work frustrated him even more. Now, I tried to distract myself with studying and council work, but I felt like I was getting ever closer to the edge of a cliff. One with hungry sharks circling the bottom. Ugh. And then there were the rumors being spread around school about me. Ruth's just a freshman. She won't be able to hack the pressure. And Ruth's so serious and boring. So I started working harder and harder to prove myself. Hence the talent show project. Only, geez, I was so exhausted. Both mentally and physically. This funding news was fantastic. But what was going on with Dane? Maybe he has some kind of secret power of attraction or something. Anyway, after that incident, he flooded me with calls and messages, even though I was crazy busy. After the twelfth call in a row, I stopped writing my essay and answered with an annoyed, What? Hey there, how are you feeling about the weather today? My name is Ruth, not there, and I don't care about the weather, I'm busy. Busy enough to correct my words like that? I don't think so. Ugh! Fine. I agreed to go out for a quick coffee with him just so he'd stop bugging me. I stirred my spoon around my coffee as I glared at him and said, Will you stop calling me? I need to study. He stuffed the majority of his muffin into his mouth and took ages to chew it. Then he wiped his mouth onto the back of his arm and said, You do realize all the other council members call you Military Ruth, right? Try not to be so difficult and chillax once, will you? Wow, that sucked. I didn't expect to be liked by everyone, but I was working my butt off for the council so they could at least appreciate what I was doing for them. I cleared my throat. I don't care. Work is work. I didn't become the president to make friends. But I know you're not like that, Dane continued. You might be going through a tough time. Still, you're the most stunning person I've ever met. My face brightened up, even blushed. What did he just say? You're beautiful, strong, and independent. He reached out and took my hand, and I tried to ignore the fact it was sticky from his muffin. Ew. I must be the luckiest guy ever to date a girl like you, Ruth. Those other girls are just jealous of you. I mean, you have this hunk. And they don't. Hold up. He said what? Date? I gave him a disgusted, who do you think you are look. Reading my expression, his face dropped. Oh, I, um, thought there was something between us. I froze for a few seconds. Was I being too harsh? I mean, he was totally sweet saying those words earlier. Fine. Listen carefully. I'll hang out with you. Not dating. But you have to promise, swear, that you'll never, ever tell anyone about it. I don't know. I mean, he was so immature and annoying, but I guess he was also kind of fun to be around. He made me laugh, and I liked that. All I did was work, work, work. 
And perhaps that was why Walter broke up with me, wasn't it? Maybe when I hang out with Dane, I should practice being less serious. One Sunday, when we were having brunch at a random cafe of his choice, I asked about his graduation coming up that summer and his plan. Honestly, I haven't thought any further than finishing my freshman year, he said between chewing on his sandwich. How about you? he asked. Well, I want to go to an Ivy League college for a master, of course, preferably Dartmouth, and study social science. Then I want to work for the government, but high up, you know, like a managing role, and really make an impact, you know? Dane shrugged after I finished. Yeah, nice plan. And kept digging in his food. I felt weird. Was I being unrealistic? Or was it just Dane's point of view? But to have a happy relationship, maybe it's best to compromise and accept the differences, right? I snapped myself back into the now. If this whole thing with Dane hadn't happened, I would still be in anguish and despair. It was strange, but I did feel better around him, unlike with Walter. So I should respect his opinions. Gotta learn from my mistake, right? One day, I was at a council meeting planning a fundraiser for the remainder of the talent show money. I decided it was time people saw the real Dane, so I made him event organizer. But this didn't go down well. As in the other council members' eyes, Dane was a lazy, idiotic puppet. Give him a chance. He's the one who persuaded Mr. Johnson to fund the talent show. Please, we never know other people's limits and abilities. Then, this girl Catherine sarcastically said, Of course you'd know his ability since he's your boyfriend. You suck at leading. All you care about is your personal feelings. I know. I'll date you. Then I may actually get given a job I deserve. My tongue was tied. I couldn't find a word to defend myself. And at the same time, I was really, really mad at Dane. And worse still, he hadn't even bothered showing up for the meeting. Afterward, I went round to Dane's house and furiously banged on the door. Yelled at him the moment he opened it. How come people know that we've been hanging out? Dane silently scratched his head eyes open wide, and stared awkwardly at some random spot. Answer me! I continued, but still, no reply. I pointed my finger at his face. I just went through a hurricane of rage in a meeting with the council to put you in charge of the fundraiser event. And you didn't even bother showing up. You better do an amazing job, else we'll both be dead. Then I stormed off. Over the next few days, the rumors continued to circulate about me. Clearly, Dane had been bragging to everyone that he'd managed to score himself a stiff girl like me, that I was no tigress, more like a lovely kitten. Now everyone was staring and laughing at me, and made meow sounds at me in the corridors. Someone even filled my seat in the council room with cat food. This was horrible to deal with, but instead of supporting me, Dane went rogue from school for a full week. He also didn't arrange the venue for the fundraiser meaning we had to reschedule the event. I was left looking bad, so the teacher gave me a lecture on responsibility and strongly advised me to leave the student council. So that's what I did. Catherine's in charge now. After that, I couldn't face school, so I locked myself away in my room and cried as I thought back to all the things that had happened. First, Walter left me. Then everyone else on the council mocked me, then I lost my position on the council I worked hard for because I put my trust in the wrong person. Ugh, Dane. <laughs> what he did hurt the most, as he was exactly what others described him as, childish and insensitive. I was torn between never wanting to see him again and also missing him like crazy. Now I had no one. I felt so alone. Ugh, darn it. Loneliness sucked. So when he called me, I answered. He told me he was outside my house. I guess I should at least hear him out, right? Hey, beautiful, listen. He grabbed my hand and looked straight into my eyes. It doesn't matter, okay? The council, the president position, those people don't matter. The most important thing is you being happy. And I'm going to make you happy. I wanted so much to believe his words. 
so I let him take me out. We ended up in this noisy restaurant with singing waiting staff. He found it hilarious, but I felt so uncomfortable. Then on the way back, he dragged me into this arcade and left me so he could go on the zombie killing game. As I watched him spin around then shoot, I realized how different we were. I guess I was holding on to him because I'd lost everything else. Who was I anymore? I felt like a stranger to myself. This wasn't me, and Dane wasn't right for me. He rushed over to me and excitingly clung onto my arm. Ruth, come see my high score. I shook my head and quietly said, It's over. I pulled my arm free and walked off. After that, I kept to myself, and at school, avoided Dane and my former council members as much as possible. It did hurt when I saw the posters for the talent show around the school, but that wasn't my problem anymore. I did receive a message from Dane saying something about his graduation party, but I skipped it. The truth is, he's just not good for me. Life was a joke to him, and as a result of this, he left me feeling like I was a joke too. I felt so lost. So I'm going to spend the summer with my grandparents out in the country, away from everyone and everything. I need time to heal, so when I come back, I'll be strong, confident, and independent girl I once was. As I really do miss that version of me. Each one of us needs to learn how to overcome things by ourselves, without relying on others. Especially when these others in question aren't any good for us. Hey, it's Jessica. From the outside, my life seemed perfect. My family is wealthy, I'm beautiful, shining bright, and even my job is fancy. But from the inside, I do have a character flaw. It's my short temper that almost caused me to lose everything. I've always been daddy's little princess, which means that anything I want, I have to get, such as new clothes, a new car, and exotic vacations. Because of this, other girls have always been jealous of me. But Kath was different. She realized there's so much more to me than my designer outfits and glossy hair. Kathy's family lived nearby. You see, my dad was friends with Kath's father, who passed away when she was little. But being the nice guy my dad is, he continued to support them. He paid for Kath's education, so we went to the same school. She was the only friend who could handle my short temper. I know, that wasn't nice but it was hard dealing with the average girl's jealousy toward me. As a result, there were a few incidents. One time, when I was just a primary student, some girl dared to put on my shirt after sports. She said it was an accident, but as if. I yelled at her that she'd stretched it, and now she owed me a new one. Kath tried to defuse the situation, but she just got caught up in the middle of the shouting match. Literally. As me and this girl were screaming insults at each other across Kath. Then another time, some kids sat in my seat in the canteen, and when I asked them to move, they refused to. I was fuming, so I poured my custard all over them. Seeing as the kids were about to get crazy, Kath passed them a napkin, hurriedly apologized to them, then led me out of there before I covered them in more of my lunch. She understood how mad I got on things, but never got annoyed at me about it. This is why our friendship continued into adulthood. It was perfect to have a friend like Kath to grow up with, but what made my life even more perfect was the arrival of our boy next door. Yes, a new family had just moved in, and my mom told me that a cute boy my age was going around meeting people. I ran out to suss it out and find Kath standing on her front porch and talking to a super cute guy. I swished out my hair and tottered over to them. Hi, Kath. I smiled at her. Then I turned to him and said, Hi there. We definitely haven't met before, because there's no way I'd forget you. He smiled back and introduced himself as Andrew and said he lived on that block. I sat down on the couch in Kath's house and did my research on Andrew and found out he was a pretty famous influencer. His dad ran off with another woman and started a new family. So Andrew lives with his mom and Nan. And best of all, he was single. I pulled on Kath's arm and insisted that she help me beg Andrew as my man. She looked a little awkward at first, but then she reluctantly agreed to help. 
I persuaded Kath to pretend that she lost her phone, then I went round to Andrew's and begged him to come and help us look for it. He spent the whole afternoon trying to help us look for it, only to hear it buzzing in my pocket. Oops. Then one time, well, this wasn't planned, but I managed to get one of my new heels stuck in a drain cover. I was standing there yelling at it when Andrew walked past and told me to take my shoe off. I refused. Did he have any idea how expensive they were? He just laughed and told me to lean on him while he carefully unwedged my shoe. Whose heart wouldn't melt for this gentle guy? After that, we started to talk more, and then chatted every day. He had a sense of humor and was very gentle toward me. It is so wonderful to know that he was impressed by how cute I was, hiding Kat's phone in my pocket to find a chance to make friends. How embarrassing, but seemed like he liked that. After two months, he asked me out on a date, and soon, we became an official couple. I loved being around his family, as his mom and grandma were so sweet and friendly. Then my dad said he needed me to go on a three-month business trip in San Diego. I didn't want to leave Andrew for so long, but there was nothing I could do about it. Ugh, being an adult sucked sometimes. I just had to pack up and take a flight to San Diego, then finish the job as quickly as possible. Little did I know how terrible things could happen in the next three months. One night, my mom called me up. She was furious, and at first, I couldn't work out what she was saying. Finally, she calmed down enough for me to make her words out. Jess, I found the DNA test hidden away in one of your father's filing cabinets. Kath is his biological daughter. This whole time, he's been lying to us. I cannot put up with this. I'm divorcing him and I won't be happy until he's left with nothing. What? Kath was my sister? No, it couldn't be. I called up Kath to get to the bottom of this. As soon as she picked up, I screamed at her. Your dad's my dad. How could you keep this a secret? You're trash, and so's your mom. You're both vile, ugly gold diggers, and I hate you both. Kath spluttered out. W what? Huh? I don't understand. You heard me. You're trash, and so's your mom. She's nothing more than a man-eating, money-obsessed liar, and I hate her. Sobbing, Kath replied, Don't talk about my mom like that. This only made me angrier, so I yelled, I will say what I want to. I hate you, and I hate her. I hope you both fall down a pothole and never get out. Suddenly, I heard a voice say in the background, who are you talking to? And why are you so upset? I knew that voice. It was Andrew's. Why was he with Kath? I was about to scream out at her to stay away from my man, but she hung up. I immediately tried calling Andrew, but he didn't answer. I was so angry, I screamed out, then went into the kitchen and started smashing glasses onto the floor and swiping things out of the cupboards. The next day, Andrew called me. I thought he was going to try and worm his way out of what he did, so I answered with a, Oh, hi, Andrew. It's nice to finally hear from you. He replied, Um, hi, Jess. Look, I have something important to tell you. Um, it's my grandma. She's in the hospital, and I can't afford the medical bills. I hate asking, but please, could I borrow some money? Furious, I yelled, who do you think you are? You did the dirty behind my back, and now you have the cheek to ask for my help? It's none of my business, dude. He fell silent, then hung up. At first, I was fuming. How dare he do that to me? But once I had time to calm down, I thought maybe I had overreacted a tiny bit. I mean, I could have given him a chance to explain, so I tried calling him again, but he didn't answer. I called Kath, and in my calmest voice, I asked her to tell me what was going on. She said she had no idea that my dad was also her real dad, and it was a lot for her to process. Then she said that she was only around at Andrew's last night because his grandma had a fever, and she was trying to help. But then her fever worsened, so she was taken to the hospital. I felt pretty bad about it all, so I tried calling Andrew again to sort all this mess out but he'd blocked my number. 
I transferred him some money over towards his grandma's expenses, but he sent it straight back to me. Ugh. <sighs> it was so hard being so far away from Andrew and not being able to go and talk things through with him. I missed him like crazy. Because of this, I confided in Kath loads, and she kept me in the loop about how Andrew's grandma was. Apparently, she wasn't well at all. Then, one day, she came up with an idea to help. She told me to send money to her account, and she'd give it to Andrew, and tell him it was from her. Then, when his grandma was better, she'd tell Andrew the truth about where the money came from, and he was sure to realize how much I cared for him and forgive me. I thought this was a great idea, so I sent Kat the money. Then things got weird. She went super quiet, and then stopped talking to me altogether. Then two months later, through social media, I found out that Andrew was getting married. To Kath! What? After having a screaming frenzy, I calmed down enough to book a flight home. I took an Uber to Andrew's house and pounded on his door. He answered, and on seeing me, he slammed the door in my face. I wasn't leaving until he spoke to me, so I sat on his doorstep. It was only when it started to rain that he eventually opened the door, and in a gruff tone said, Okay, you have two minutes. Then I want you off my property for good. Look, I know you're mad, and I'm sorry, but why are you ignoring me? I tried to make amends for what I did. I sent you the money. I know. I sent it straight back, remember? He grunted. Not that money. The money that Kath gave to you and said was from me. What? That money was from her, not you. You're jealous. You found out I was marrying her, and you're here to ruin our lives. No, no, I'm not. Please, it was me. I wanted to help. I pleaded, but he tutted, then slammed the door again. I stood there, a soggy mess, and his words sunk in. Kath had lied to Andrew about the money. Why would she do that? Furious, I stormed around to her house and was about to press the buzzer down until she answered when the door opened, and I saw Kath stepping out with Andrew's mom. I jumped out of sight and listened. Andrew's mom was thanking her for all her help and saying how much she couldn't wait for her to be her daughter-in-law. What? As soon as his mom walked off, I jumped out of hiding and confronted Kath. You're a liar! Kath was surprised seeing me, but then she just shrugged and said, Whatever, then walked toward her door. He's my man now, not yours, she added, looking back at me. You traitor! I screamed at her as I charged towards her. We got into a fight, and there was a lot of hair pulling. Finally, Kath managed to get through her entrance door and lock me out. She grinned at me through the window, so I shouted at her. Kath, you just wait. You won't get away with this. A few days passed, and their wedding day arrived. It was in some super swanky golf resort. I tried sneaking in through the entrance, but two guards stopped me. Ugh, Kath must have pre-warned them about me. So I had to find another way in, which involved climbing through a tiny gap in the hedge. A bodycon dress wasn't my best choice, and I had twigs in my hair and grass stains all over me. Still, out of breath, I showed up at the aisle and waved the evidence of bank statements and messages between me and Kath in Andrew's face, and shouted, Look, this is all the proof you need to show that I sent the money to Kath to help your grandma, and she's a filthy liar! Andrew looked shocked, but he took the evidence from me. No, she's making it up! Kath's eyes widened in alarm as she tried to grab the evidence out of Andrew's hands. Seeing her reaction, he pulled it away from her and looked through it, his face falling when he discovered the truth. How could you lie to me about this? He stared at her. You told me that Jess cut all contact with you. Teary-eyed, Kath glared at me and said, You get everything, the nice clothes and the lavish lifestyle, yet you act like a spoiled brat. I was sick of hiding in your shadow and defending you for all your childish outbursts. I liked Andrew from the beginning, but no, you had to have him. Through gritted teeth, Andrew told her, It's over, Kath. I never want to see you ever again. After that, she rushed up the aisle in a frenzy of white fabric and sobs. Jeez, talk about making an exit. That was three months ago.
and a lot has changed since then. My dad eventually managed to persuade Mum to forgive him, although he had to buy her a new car and take her on a month-long island getaway. Also, she insisted that she never wanted to see Kath or her mom ever again, so Dad arranged for them to move to another city. This worked for me, as I never wanted to see Kath again either. I know I have a short temper, and I overreact sometimes, but I honestly believed that Kath was my friend. It hurt knowing that she didn't care about me at all. She just wanted my life. As for Andrew and me, now we're back together and there's no way I'm letting my short temper cause me to lose him again. All of this could have been avoided if I hadn't let my anger blindside me. I should have trusted him from the start and heard him out. So now, if I feel anger overtaking my thoughts, I will go and pace the yard first to calm down. I may look like a crazy person, but it works a treat. So, finding out that my amazing adoptive parents were actually highly likely to be the biological parents of Lisa was a shocker. The clues were there, such as Lisa's flower bracelet turned necklace and her diamond-shaped birthmark that were identical to my adoptive parents' missing childs. Surely, this couldn't just be coincidence. Back in the orphanage, Lisa and I used to talk about our real families returning for us, but I put this down to childish naivety. I never believed it could actually happen. I kept my news a secret for a few days while I absorbed all this information. It was a life changer for us all. I couldn't shake the image of mom sitting on the balcony sadly, looking through the old baby box she kept of her missing child. She'd missed out on years of her daughter's life. So if Lisa really was her missing daughter, then I didn't want to be the one to keep them apart any longer. The next day after school, I invited Lisa over. I sat them all down and told them my theory. I made Lisa show them her bracelet to her necklace and the diamond-shaped birthmark on the top of her right arm. This shocked both my adoptive parents and Lisa, but it also made loads of sense. Seeing Lisa next to them made me realize how much she looked like my adoptive mom. They took a DNA test, and it was a tense few days as they waited for the results. When they came back positive, my parents burst into tears and wouldn't stop hugging both Lisa and me. It wasn't long after this that I realized I hadn't thought this through properly. Why would my adoptive family want me when they now had their real kid back? Would they soon get sick of me and kick me out? Or would they do a trade-off with Lisa's adoptive family and I'd be stuck in their poor household babysitting their little boy? My parents wouldn't quit going on about Lisa. They constantly asked how she was, blah, blah, blah. They never asked me about my day anymore. Instead, they wanted me to tell them everything about Lisa. They invited Lisa over all the time. She always seemed to be in my living room watching documentaries with dad or in the kitchen helping mom cook. One time, I arrived home late to find Lisa sleeping in my bed. This really bugged me, as she didn't live here. This was my adoptive family. She had her own. I went back to low-key hating Lisa again, like I did back when we'd been in the orphanage together. I was super nice to her face, but behind the scenes, I did little things to mess up her day and to make myself feel better. One time, I put her homework in the trash. Another time, I hid her jacket so she had to go out in the rain in just a thin sweatshirt, and I stuck used chewing gum in her pencil case. I know these things were mean of me to do, but I was so afraid of losing my new family to perfect Lisa. I just wanted them to love me, but I felt second best. One time after school, I was playing basketball with the boys at school. Then I saw my mom and dad come and pick up Lisa from school. They all looked so happy, laughing, talking to each other. Why had they picked her up and not me? I'm the one who actually lives with them. Ugh, why were they purposely leaving me out? I had flashbacks to being back in the orphanage and how Lisa's adoptive parents picked her over me. Why was it always her and not me? What was wrong with me? I felt so unloved, but most of all, I felt mad. I couldn't face going home and watching them play happy families, so I went and stayed at my friend's house. The more I thought about it, the more I didn't want to go back home. I tried to convince myself that it wasn't a big deal because I've always been a stray cat since I was born, so I'd be just fine by myself. I knew I couldn't stay at my friends forever, 
so my plan was to sneak home at midnight and pick up some stuff before I left this town for good. That night, as I got to the fence and about to climb in, I noticed the light on the balcony was still on. My mom was sitting there with a glass of wine and crying. Then dad came comforting mom and said, she'll be home soon, and led mom back inside. It was so heartbreaking to watch, and I felt so stupid for all of my selfish thoughts. They must be very upset, as the worst thing that had ever happened to them was losing a child, and now my disappearing act was making them relive it. They even adopted an older kid so this wouldn't happen, and I'd gone and run off like a spoiled brat. I swallowed my pride and walked into my house, where I saw that the living room was full of decorations and a fallen-down banner that read, Thank you, Eva. My parents heard my footsteps, so they came downstairs, and as soon as they saw me, they both ran at me and hugged me so tightly, then they burst into tears. It turned out that they'd only been picking Lisa up from school that day as they were throwing me a surprise party, thanking me for helping reunite them. But I never came home. They'd been terrified that they'd lost another kid, and they didn't think they could deal with the heartbreak again. I cried and told them all of my worries and thoughts about being left out and abandoned again, as Lisa was already picked over me once before. They said, Silly, you're both our kids. If anything, we now love you even more, because you're the angel who reunited this family. So, did they trade me with Lisa's family? <laughs> nah. Besides, Lisa and I are both off to college now. Lisa now has two loving families, and we're back to being the best of friends. In fact, I don't just view her as my friend. She's also my sister. Although, we're still fighting to decide who the big sister is. She's older than me by three months, but I'm taller and bossier, so I maintain it's me. I had to wait a while to find my perfect family, but it turns out they were all definitely worth the wait. One day, I was cycling to class, and I wasn't really paying attention because I was running late. I reached into my backpack to text my friend, telling her to cover for me in case the professor asked where I was. Suddenly, my phone flew out of my hand, and the next moment, there was just darkness all around me. They said it was a miracle I'd survived. The truck had come speeding around the corner and knocked me off my bicycle, sending me flying onto the sidewalk. If I'd cracked my head open, I'd be dead, but I wasn't all that lucky. My spine was so badly damaged, I'd never walk again. I tried to feel grateful to just be alive. But being in a wheelchair was hard. I was completely paralyzed from the waist down, so my parents had to do everything for me. The first time my mom had to bathe me, I just lay there and cried. I was 20 years old, and here I was, like a baby again. It was humiliating, and I could see how much it was affecting my parents. Mom had quit her job to look after me, but she was miserable. One day, I couldn't take it anymore and begged her to go back to work and hire a professional caregiver to look after me instead. They put an ad online, but it took a few days for anyone to apply. And the only person that applied was a young guy named Jason with no experience. My mom hired him anyway because she said he seemed so enthusiastic about becoming a caregiver. I was so angry. I didn't want some strange guy helping me get dressed and helping me go to the toilet. But then I saw him, and all those thoughts disappeared in an instant. He was so good looking. I couldn't believe it. I could barely look at him without blushing. I knew right away that we'd get on well, and that he'd just have to close his eyes whenever I needed to use the toilet. We'd figure it out. At first, he was quite shy. Whenever I asked him about his family or his past, he'd always become quiet and change the subject. It was like he was scared to open up to me. But the more he looked after me, the closer we became. Then one day, we were out in the park, and something happened. He'd packed a picnic for us, and just before we stopped to eat it, he bent down and kissed me on my forehead. It felt like the world came to a standstill. I just wanted to be in that moment forever. After that, it was clear we liked each other a lot. I couldn't tell my mom because I knew she'd be mad at me for falling in love with my caregiver. But it wasn't my fault. I didn't want her to fire him. So we kept it a secret. 
It was perfect. Every day, her and my dad would leave for work, and I'd get to spend all day with my boyfriend. We went to the park every day and to the movies once a week, and we even started learning Spanish together. But then one day, he called in sick. It was completely out of the blue, and it wasn't a good time for my family, because the court case trial was coming up in a few days. My dad was a lawyer and had insisted that we proceed with the trial because he truly believed the man in the truck deserved to be punished for almost killing me. I really wanted to put it all behind us and move on, but I knew there was no arguing with my dad. Jason was still sick the day of the trial, and I kept texting him, asking him to be there for me, but he said he couldn't get out of bed. I wanted to take him some soup or something, but he wouldn't even tell me his address. In the end, I had no choice but to go to court without him and hope it would all be over quickly. As soon as the truck driver appeared, I could feel how angry my parents were. He looked like the kind of guy who didn't care about what he had done to me. And as soon as he pleaded not guilty to the judge, my dad jumped up and started shouting. I was so embarrassed, and the judge called for a break before it was my turn to stand up and testify. I wheeled myself out of there in tears. All I wanted to do was see Jason, and little did I know, that wish was about to come true. I went outside to get some air, and I was pushing myself so fast I almost bumped into someone. When I looked up, I realized it was Jason. I was so happy to see him, I almost cried. But he did not look happy to see me. In fact, he was turning bright red. I thought you were sick, I asked him, and before he could answer, a woman appeared from behind me and said, Jason, your dad needs you in there. Come on, son. I didn't understand. I asked Jason what was going on, and the woman looked at me and said, How do you know my son? Then she walked back inside. Jason looked at me and said sorry, and then he told me why he was really there. His dad was the truck driver who'd almost killed me. When he'd found out, he told his dad to come clean and admit his fault, but his dad wouldn't. Jason had felt so guilty about it that he applied for a job as a caregiver but he hadn't realized I was the girl his dad had run over until a few days ago. When the letter had come through for the trial, he'd seen my name and almost vomited in shock. I sat there completely shaking. How could he have kept this from me? This couldn't be happening. The love of my life was the son of the man who put me in a wheelchair. I had about 10 minutes before I had to go back in there and tell the truth. I knew it would hurt Jason to see his dad go to jail. But what choice did I have? I told the truth, and now we're waiting to see what his sentence will be. I love Jason, but I don't know what our future will look like. My parents can't accept that we're together, and nor can his. I can't help but think, though, that if I hadn't been in the accident, I'd never have even met Jason. I guess at least there's one silver lining in all of this. Hey, I'm Anita. I'm 15, and I have a disease called CIP, which stands for Congenital Insensitivity to Pain. This means that I don't feel pain like you do. In fact, I've never been in pain, and I have no idea what it feels like. This is an extremely rare hereditary disease. My great-grandpa had it, and it skipped a few generations before it was passed down to me. I know you're probably thinking that feeling no pain sounds great, but I can assure you that it isn't as good as it sounds. We are meant to feel pain for a reason. It's there to warn us when something is wrong, whether it be a toothache, a fever, or when a substance is too hot. I've never been able to run a bath by myself. My mom has to run it for me and check the temperature. It also means that when I'm in the bath, I can't refill it with hot water in case I burn myself. I can feel hot and cold, but I have no idea what a burn feels like or what being so cold your toes hurt feels like. I also have to cut up my food and let it cool down for five minutes before I eat it so I don't burn my mouth. I don't even bother with hot drinks. I just stick to drinking juice. I watch my friends with curiosity when they accidentally hurt themselves. I just find their in-pain expressions so odd. My mom shut her finger in the trunk of the car and screamed before she walked off shaking her hand for at least 10 minutes. If I shut my finger in the trunk, I wouldn't even flinch, 
which is bad because it means I could cause myself more of an injury. My great-grandpa, the one who also had CIP, died at the age of 40 from heart disease. He didn't have any symptoms because of his CIP, so he had no warning signs that he was seriously ill. My parents are terrified that I will end up ill too and not realize it. They make me go to the doctors for a monthly checkup. There is no definite cure for CIP, although there are some experimental treatments out there. My parents have refused these, as they don't want me to end up feeling like a lab rat. They say it's up to me to decide if I want to try any when I reach 18. I have scars on my arm from when I was in a restaurant and spilt a boiling mug of tea on it, but because I didn't feel pain, I didn't flinch or put it under cold water. I once fell off a climbing frame and twisted my ankle, but continued to walk on it for the rest of the day. That evening, my mom saw my ankle was swollen and took me to the hospital. Turns out I'd badly sprained it and caused myself more injury by walking around on it all day. I was on crutches for weeks. I'm not allowed to take part in any sports for fear of hurting myself, and I don't use the cooker or the kettle. My mom has to tell me if I need to put sun lotion on or to wear a jacket. If it's really sunny, my mom doesn't let me go out at midday as she's worried I'll end up badly sunburned. Even though I wasn't meant to play sports, once, at lunchtime, I joined in with my friends and played basketball. A boy tried to take the ball off me, and I was shoved hard onto the ground. He was staring at me, open-mouthed, and some of the other kids were gasping at me. I looked down at my arm. It had popped out of its socket and was hanging there limp. I hadn't even realized. The boy walked with me to the nurse's room, and I sat down on the metal frame bed, all smiles. At least... That was until my body went into meltdown and I fainted. I woke up three hours later in hospital with my arm in a bandage. Needless to say, my parents were furious with me. When I was younger, some kids used to poke and hit me to see if I would flinch. I used to be covered in marks and bruises and my parents were horrified. They complained to my teacher who gave the entire school a lecture about the dangers of my condition and how their actions could have put me in hospital. Now that I'm older, I find that most kids try and steer well away from me in fear of accidentally harming me, especially since the arm popping incident. It makes me feel sad, but there's nothing I can do about it. My friend Kayla says I'm like a real life superhero. I don't think I have a very good power at all. I'd much rather be able to have super speed or turn invisible. I do worry about my future. I hope I don't end up ill and not realize it like my great grandpa. My condition makes my life difficult at times, but I'm not going to let it get in my way. I may not be a superhero, but I am me, and I will try my best to protect myself from injuries and have a normal life. Thanks for listening to my story! Like this post if you believe that we have to make the most of our lives regardless of the obstacles we have to face. Please leave a comment with your thoughts on my story. I'd love to hear them. It was a regular morning, and I was sorting my books out in my locker when excited screams and cheers distracted me. Huh? It was way too early for this level of noise. A group of girls was lingering around the bulletin board. I walked over to take a look. Turns out, it was just the latest poster of Hillary, the prettiest girl in school, for her campaign of becoming prom queen. <sighs> well, yeah. Typical reaction since Hillary alone is too perfect already. All day, I found myself thinking about the Queen Hillary poster. Oh, I wish I could be as beautiful as she is. I mean, I'm not that ugly, but damn sure I'm not beautiful like her. OMG, look at me. My cheekbones aren't defined enough. My lips aren't pumped enough. My hair is too frizzy and I literally have to jump on the spot to get myself into my favorite pair of jeans. Ugh, let's face it, I was plain and ordinary, while Hillary, she was oh so beautiful. Mom called me down for dinner, so I sat there glumly twirling my fork around my plate. Mom must have noticed something was up, as frowning she asked me, Sonia, what's wrong? You've barely touched your dinner. I'm not hungry. I sighed out. Anyways, I'm big enough already. And ugly enough. Sweetie, don't be silly. You look lovely. Yeah, right. Mom was only saying that because she felt like she had to. 
I thanked her for dinner, then went back to my room and scrolled through Hillary's profile. There wasn't one bad picture of her. Not one! She was so flawless, while I was, well, full of flaws. The next day, I was hanging out on the school field with my best friend Sydney and my boyfriend Lucas, when Hillary passed by in a stunning dress. Jeez, look how gorgeous she was. Earth to Sonia! Sydney threw a potato chip at me. I turned and gave her a what-was-that-for look. She rolled her eyes and continued. Stop staring at little Miss Popular and pay attention to us. You know, your actual friends? Hello? Sorry. I sighed. It's just that she looks so pretty in that dress. It's not fair. She doesn't even have to try. Well, on me, it'd look like I was wearing a garbage bag. Stop comparing yourself to her. It's dumb. Yeah, Hillary's Hillary. You are you. And you have your own beauty. I shook my head. Yeah, right. I didn't have any beauty. Instead, I was ordinary, while Hillary was extraordinary. Chemistry was the only class I shared with Hillary. And for that entire 45 minutes, I just couldn't stop staring over at her, transfixed. As the teacher droned on about the periodic table, I daydreamed about how amazing it would be to have hair as glossy, skin as clear as hers. I caught her staring back at me a couple of times, and one time she mouthed, What? Then rolled her eyes and annoyedly turned away. But still, I couldn't take my eyes off of her. After the lesson, I followed her to her next class, even though it was in a different direction to where I needed to be. I watched on with envy as her boyfriend, Ethan, the captain of the basketball team, looked at her adoringly, and how her pretty friends flocked around her. It must be so awesome to be that perfect. My Hillary obsession continued at home. Each evening, I scrolled through her profile and saved any new pics she'd posted. Then I'd just lay in bed staring at her perfect features and comparing them to my not-so-perfect ones. I even printed out my fave pics of her and framed them on my desk. <sighs> then one day, my worst nightmare came true. I was on my way to meet Lucas when I saw him standing in the hallway and talking to Hillary. That's odd. A popular girl like Hillary would never enjoy talking to a normie like him. Oh man, look how Lucas keeps laughing then giggling. What if Hillary likes him? That kind of girl definitely gets whatever she wants easily. I couldn't watch any more of this, so I sent Sydney an emergency message and rushed off to the bathroom. She found me crying in the cubicle and asked me what was wrong. I told her what had happened and she frowned. Are you insane? Lucas was probably just being polite to her. Jeez, he's with you for a reason, so get over this Hillary fixation. It's weird. Why did Sydney have to be so rude? I wanted her support, not her backlash. So, I didn't meet up with her after school as planned. Instead, I went straight home and looked through my Hillary photos. I cut out sections of her lips, nose, hair, and stuck them on top of a photo of me. Looking down at it, well, wow, I looked so much better. It was then that I decided I would have a perfect face like her. So clutching the improved photo, I hurried down to my mom and waved it in her face. Look how perfect I'd be if I changed a few things. Please will you lend me the money to pay for surgery? Please? Mom looked horrified. Sonia, you're only 17, and you're already beautiful. You don't need to put yourself through all this pain and risks to look like someone else. I tried explaining to her that I didn't want to continue my life looking as plain and boring as I did, but she didn't listen at first. It took me a lot of time to talk her through, and let's face it, she also has had a nose job before. So what's the big deal about me getting mine fixed too, along with a few more touch-ups? That summer, I lied to Sydney and Lucas that I was spending the whole holiday with my dad and stepmom. I showed the surgeon a photo of Hillary as an example of the results I wanted. So he narrowed my nose, inserted cheek implants to give me a more defined look, and injected my lips with filler. I woke up after surgery in agony, 
Oh, dear God, it hurts. I couldn't talk, and even crying was painful. Worse still, with all the bandages, I resembled an Egyptian mummy. Then, when the bandages were removed, my face was all swollen and puffy, and I had to do these massages to improve my facial muscles again. Pain is beauty, and beauty is pain, isn't it? Mum wasn't exactly impressed with what I did, as I didn't really tell her I would change my entire face. Still, she spent the summer looking after me, even though I did have to put up with her whining and sometimes even tears. Once healed, all that was left to do was have my hair colored and cut like Hillary's, and change my style to match hers. With my new look complete, I looked at the mirror and smiled. Finally, I was beautiful. I returned to school excited for everyone to see my new look, but as I walked through the hallway, everyone stared and gossiped about me. People I didn't know surrounded me and bombarded me with questions such as, which parts did you fix? How much? And did it hurt? Nobody actually complimented me or anything. Then, as I was sorting out my locker, I heard a cough. I looked up to see Sydney standing there with her arms folded. So, was it worth it? I wasn't in the mood for this, so I replied, You can't say anything nice, can you? This is who I am now. I'm being my true self, and I'm happy. No, this is you trying to be someone you're not. I slammed my locker shut and stormed off. What kind of person doesn't support her own best friend? My day went from bad to worse when I met Lucas at lunch. He glared at me, then angrily said, Sonia, why? There was nothing wrong with you before, but now you're just a clone of someone else. He went to leave, but I held his arm. Please, I did this because I want to be more beautiful. For you. I did this for you. Lucas shook his head, then gave a thoughtful sigh. He didn't try to leave after that, but he kept giving me this pitying look. Then, when I was walking to class, a guy ran up behind me and put his arm around my waist. Hi there, my baby. Startled, I immediately pushed him away. Oh, it was Ethan, Hillary's boyfriend. What's wrong? But, wait, why does your face look so weird? I pushed him off me and ran away. OMG, that was horrifying. My heart was still pumping. From then on, people continued to mistake me for Hillary. Then whenever Sydney sat with me, they gossiped about how tragic it was that she was trying to be a cool kid. It made her feel uncomfortable, so she stopped hanging out with me at school. I had to sit by myself and felt so lonely. Then there was Lucas. Whenever I tried so much as hug him, he flinched. Then he admitted that he found my new look strange and intimidating. Life carried on, and prom grew closer. I noticed one of the Queen Hillary posters had been ripped off, and in its place was another poster of a girl named Kim. Jeez, this prom queen campaign seems very stressful. Then, as I stepped outside, I heard someone shout, Now! Then the next thing I knew, stuff was thrown at me. In just a blink, I was covered in tomatoes and eggs. Yuck! Then a group of girls smirking stepped out and one said, You should just give up trying to be prom queen before it's too late. I blurted out while taking pieces of eggshell off of my hair. What? Why attack me? Oh wait! Girls, it's the plastic Hillary wannabe. Well, you still deserve this. Have fun being a failed version of Hillary. They laughed as they left, leaving me standing there feeling worse than ever. I went to the bathroom to clean myself up and walked in on Hillary applying her makeup in the mirror. Whoa, her face actually wasn't so perfect with all the makeup on. Oh, wow, it's you. She glanced at me. You know, everyone is talking about you even more than me, she said, while covering her eyelid with tons of eyeshadows. I mean, I'm kind of flattered, but trust me, you look ridiculous. You're like the Walmart version of me. I feel sorry for Lucas for having a super insecure girlfriend like you. Then she flicked her hair and left. 
I looked at myself in the mirror, tears streaming down my face. So Hillary was just a mean girl who faked her butt off to build a friendly image and covered her mediocre face with a lot of makeup. She wasn't perfect, just like me. From then on, I desperately longed to look like myself again. I begged mom to lend me the money to fix my face, but she refused. No more. Once is enough. Isn't this all you wanted? Great. Now I was going to be stuck looking like this forever. Until one night, my cheeks started aching. Soon, I couldn't so much as twitch my face without being in serious pain. Mom found me clutching my face in agony and drove me to the hospital. The doctor told me my implants had leaked and I needed emergency surgery to remove them. This happened a few months ago. Now, when I look in the mirror, luckily, I don't see Hillary anymore. Instead, I see me, but in a quite different look. I've well and truly learned my lesson, and Sydney and Lucas have been there to help me through everything. Now I know that I should have learned how to love myself instead of comparing myself to someone else. I am who I am. And you know what? I now realize that I'm okay with that. Can you imagine what it's like to be so pretty that people actually bully you because of it? Most of you are probably thinking that being pretty is an amazing thing. But just wait until you hear my story. I'm Jasmine, and I'm 16 years old. And yep, I am indeed named after Princess Jasmine. Because the moment I was born, my dad said I looked exactly like her. So growing up, I was naturally very pretty, and the older I got, the more the boys chased me. But I was oblivious to this. Just because I was pretty didn't mean I was arrogant about it. In fact, I was a very caring kid. I always liked to help people in my class and really didn't care about the way people looked. I wanted to help everyone. One time in third grade, there were three boys fighting and I went to help them. But to my complete shock, they were fighting over me. Our teacher eventually broke up the fight and had to split them all up and make them sit on the opposite side of the classroom, away from me. I was so shocked. Why would people fight over me? Well, by the time I was in fifth grade, I'd gotten even prettier. And at one point, there were five guys fighting over me. One day, two of those guys, Jack and Tyler, were both running towards me from opposite sides of the playground. I was just standing there watching them come towards me, and I panicked and quickly jumped out of the way. They both ended up bashing into each other and fell over. Honestly, it was so funny. I helped them up, but inside, I was dying of laughter. Most girls would probably love getting attention like that, but it drove me crazy. I just wanted people to like me for who I was, not because I was pretty. Even though I got tons of attention from boys, the girls didn't like me. There was one girl called Mia who hated me so much, she actually bullied me. She would always go out of her way to do horrible things to me. Like this one time where she jumped on me in gym class and broke my right arm. She pretended it was an accident, but I know she deliberately did it. And obviously, I use my right arm for everything, so it was torture. I cried so much because for months, I couldn't write anything. And writing was my most favorite thing in the world. And that wasn't the only horrible encounter with Mia. One time I was at the park with my big brother, and he left me alone on the swings so he could go hang out with his friends. As soon as he was out of sight, I saw Mia heading towards me. She looked angry, and I quickly closed my eyes because I was so scared. I thought she was going to hit me. But suddenly, I heard someone running, and I opened my eyes just in time to see my brother grab her arm to stop her from hitting me. He was protecting me, but then he took it too far. He hit her in the face so hard, he knocked her front tooth out. She was screaming and crying, and my brother just grabbed me and made me run out of the park with him. After that, Mia didn't bother me anymore. I moved up to middle school and never saw her again, but my life didn't get much better. You see, at my new school, the uniforms were so ugly. I went from being the pretty girl to a complete tomboy. 
we had to wear these red polo shirts with baggy nude pants. Honestly, it was not a good look for me. Sure, I was glad not to be the girl guys were fighting over anymore, but I didn't like feeling ugly in the uniform. Then, when we had the school dance, we were finally allowed to wear whatever we wanted. I decided to wear my favorite little black dress that showed off my curvy body. As soon as I walked through the doors into the dance, all eyes were on me. I couldn't believe how much of a difference my outfit could make. All the guys kept trying to get my attention, but I just wanted to dance. It was such a fun night, but the next day was crazy. I got to class and we had to hand in our essays. I went to give mine to the teacher, and when I was walking back to my seat, a girl called Paloa stopped me and said, Jasmine, everyone knows your melons are fake. You had plastic surgery, didn't you? She said it so loud and everyone started laughing, even my friends. I was so embarrassed and just ran out of there crying. Why would she say something like that? To make matters even worse, when I eventually came back to my desk, I noticed someone had messed with my artwork. I love drawing, especially Dragon Ball characters, and I'd drawn a Goku that morning. Someone had ruined it by drawing fake boobs, and then underneath they'd written, You are so fake. I honestly wanted to run out of there and never go back. People were being so mean. Suddenly, a guy called Peter, who was always quite horrible to me, grabbed the drawing and ripped it up. I didn't understand how people could treat me like this. The rest of my middle school life was pretty much the same. I felt miserable, and I thought finally high school would be better. But on my first day, I was sitting alone, and I heard a group of girls whispering about me. They were all really pretty and popular, and I tried to ignore them, but two of them came over to me and sat on either side of me. I felt terrified, but suddenly one of them said, Oh my god, you're so pretty. How come you're eating all alone? You can come sit at our table because you're pretty enough. After my middle school experience, I was so happy that people were being nice to me again. Soon I started hanging out with the pretty girls all the time, and the leader of the group, Ashley, she asked me if I had a boyfriend. And when I told her I didn't, she laughed and said, Don't you worry, we'll find you one. But I didn't want them to find me one, because the more I hung out with them, the more I realized that the guys they liked were total troublemakers, and I wasn't interested in those type of guys at all. After a few weeks of hanging out with them, I realized they were too much. I didn't want to spend my days gossiping and being surrounded by drama. Just because I was a pretty girl didn't mean I had to hang out with the pretty girls. I heard there was a new kid at school, and the girls were all making fun of him for some reason. I didn't like what they were saying about him. And so the next day, I decided to go introduce myself and see if he was okay. Well, I have no idea why people were making fun of him. He was gorgeous. Drop dead gorgeous. But he was so shy, and so I just sat on a table near him and stared at him nonstop. I eventually plucked up the courage to go and introduce myself. Hi, I'm Jasmine, I said. Nice to meet you. Then he said, I'm Chris. Hi. And after that, we got chatting and I couldn't believe how much we had in common. I could see everyone staring at us chatting, but I didn't care. Chris said he'd worried that no one would want to be his friend, and I told him that I would be. After that, we started hanging out every day, and I quickly fell for him. He was kind of nerdy, but I liked that about him. One day, before Valentine's, he asked me what my favorite candy was. Then on Valentine's Day, he surprised me with flowers, a box of chocolates, and a teddy bear. Then a few days after, he gave me another surprise. He'd ordered all my favorite candy, Skittles, Sour Patch Kids, and Airheads. I was so happy. It was the most romantic thing anyone had ever done for me. And he wasn't interested in me just because I was pretty. He actually cared about me. We started dating soon after that, and then I had my first kiss. It was kind of funny because I'd never kissed anyone before, so I had no idea what I was doing, but it felt nice. And after a while, I really got the hang of it. And now we're so in love. It's been seven months since we started dating, and I never could have imagined my life could be so good now. We're even planning to get married in the future. I know we're still young, but when you know, you know.
My name's Laura, and I'm 14 years old. When I was a kid, I went through so much traumatic stuff that it has left me permanently scarred in the craziest way. I was three years old when my dad died from a heart attack. My mom really couldn't cope after this. She started drinking and smoking a lot. So my grandparents stepped in and decided to take care of me for a couple of years. But then three years later, my mom got diagnosed with cancer and died. It was a complete nightmare for me. But luckily, my grandparents were there for me. I used to secretly cry myself to sleep every night, and then during the day, I'd try to smile and pretend to be happy, as not to worry my grandparents. It was such a tough time for me. Fast forward four years, and I started getting these weird blackouts every day. At first, I thought it was because of school or something, so I didn't really pay attention to it. But then, one day, I was at my best friend Maria's house for a sleepover, and it happened. I walked into her room, and suddenly, I blacked out! When I woke up the next morning, Maria was staring at me and looked kind of scared. She said I'd acted like a completely different person the night before. I couldn't remember anything and felt so embarrassed, so I told her I needed to go home and rushed out of there. When I got home, I googled blackout and memory loss, and suddenly, a page popped up saying DID symptoms, so I clicked on it to see what it said. It said things like, a person may experience blackouts and act differently. So I ran downstairs to tell my grandparents about it. They weren't surprised and said they'd noticed I'd acted a bit strange sometimes. So they called the hospital to arrange an appointment for the following day. Maria texted me to ask if I was okay. So I asked her to tell me about the night before. She said she'd asked me if I wanted to eat pizza for dinner. And I told her that I'm not hungry, which is weird as I'm pretty much always hungry. Then she said I just sat on her bed texting someone and that I looked like a robot. I wasn't smiling or laughing or anything. It was kind of creepy, so she left the room for a bit. But when she came back, I was playing with her dog, looking all playful and hyper. All that really freaked her out. The next day, my grandparents took me to the hospital to get some tests done. I was feeling so scared by this point. I had to get an MRI scan on my head. And afterwards, the doctor walked me up to my grandparents and started whispering to them. I couldn't hear anything the doctor was saying, but the next moment, my grandma was crying. I felt so sad. I'd never seen her cry before, and I couldn't stand it. The doctor turned to me and explained that I have something called Dissociative Identity Disorder, DID. Basically, this means I have multiple personalities, and in my case, I have four. I've even given them names. Emily, Lily, Anna, and of course, myself, Laura. The doctor tried to ask me about when this could have started and what could have been the cause of it, and it seems it had to be because of my parents passing away. That's the most traumatic memory I could think of. It's been a while ever since I was diagnosed. It has gotten my life much more complicated, but I've kind of worked my way around it. I once asked my grandma to help me figure out what these personalities were like, as every time it happened, I blacked out and couldn't remember anything. She had helped me ask the personalities the same questions and noted down things that happened. So, visual-wise, our styles are quite similar. We all like wearing jeans and crop tops, except for Lily. She prefers leggings and an oversized hoodie. The one thing about us that's really different, and by looking at this, you will be able to tell us apart, is how we do our hair. I like mine half up, half down. Emily likes hers down. Lily likes hers in a ponytail, and Anna likes hers in a messy bun. We also found out that Emily likes pop music. Her favorite hobby is dancing, and she hates sweets. Any ideal day to her would be sitting by the window with her cat while sipping her tea. Then there's Lily. She doesn't like music at all, and she likes to go skating and eat healthy food. She spends all her free time at the skate park. Lastly, there's Anna. She's really quiet and likes classical music, reading books, and drawing. I too love drawing, so maybe my personality is closest to Anna's. Sometimes we would leave notes for each other on a piece of paper if we have something to tell the other personalities, as that's the only way for us to communicate. DID is something I've just had to get used to. The change usually happens anywhere between two to six hours after a personality takes control, but when I'm stressed, it can happen every 30 minutes. The longest I was one personality was eight hours. It was Lily, and she went to the skate park and broke her leg, but luckily, we're okay now. Lily is definitely the rebel one. One time, she took my paints and wrote on the class bully's locker, you are a loser, Mackenzie. I mean, it served her right. This girl was a serious bully. Usually, I can feel when I'm about to change personalities, but I can't decide which one will take control. Sometimes, different things can trigger the change, too, 
like some certain smell or the place or food that is special to a specific personality. Cool, right? It doesn't always go to plan, though. On many occasions, I've burnt my toaster pancakes because I had a switch while making breakfast. I just froze there for a moment. It's kind of funny. And one time when I was 12, I was in a school play. I was playing the main character, and in the middle of the play, I changed personalities. It was so embarrassing. But before the play, I made sure all of my personalities knew the lines. So I think it was okay in the end. For the most part, people are understanding. My teachers know about it, and no one usually notices when it happens in class, as the only thing I do is change my hairstyle or the way I hold my pen. But some people are a bit mean to me. They say I'm faking it or doing it for attention. But I just ignore these people. They have no idea what it's like to live with this. Then there are nice moments, like the drawing my friend's little sister did for me. It had four girls on it, all of my personalities, and it was super cute. I also have had a girlfriend before, and she was super understanding. Despite me switching personalities during our dates, it was undeniably awkward, but we just laughed it off. All four of us loved her, and the same goes for everyone else in our lives. We've agreed on only meeting people that we all like, because if one personality doesn't like a person, it can get kind of annoying. And so, this is my life. 75% of the time, I am not Laura, not myself, but it's something I've just had to learn to live with. There's no cure, so all I can do is endure it and try to make life easier. And even so, I love myself, all four versions of me. Hi guys, my name's Rachel, and I want to tell you my big secret. Most people hate pain, right? When they stub their toe or nick their finger, they say, ouch, and shake the area they hurt like a maniac. I've seen other people do this. My mom, for instance, as she's the clumsiest person ever. But I'm not like most other people. You see, I'm a masochist. This means I get pain for pleasure. Yeah, so, okay, I know it sounds wrong. But to me, it just feels so right. It all started when I was 10. I was a naughty kid. I drew on walls, threw rocks at my neighbor's window, and swore a lot. One time, I was in my parents' room searching through their things when I saw my mom's favorite silver necklace. It was so pretty. So, like a magpie drawn to shiny things, I couldn't resist picking it up and trying it on. Mom came in and yelped when she saw me wearing it. What do you think you're doing, young lady? Take that off this instant. No, it's mine. I clutched onto it. Mom got mad and screamed out how I was a vile child. This made me angry, so I yanked the necklace off, which broke the chain. Then I threw it at her as I said, Here, have it. Mom saw red and slapped me hard across my face. I felt a jolt of pain, so I ran to my room. It hurt, but it kind of felt exciting. I was too young to understand it. All I knew back then was that I found it thrilling. Mom came into my room and apologized to me. I'm very sorry for slapping you. Can you ever forgive me? I quickly smiled and said, Sure, it's quite all right. This surprised her as I normally held a grudge. I decided to get in trouble again so I could see if my pain thrill was a one-off or not. I went into the kitchen, grabbed a plate, and smashed it. My parents were furious at me, especially when I shrugged and told them I'd done it because I just felt like it. My dad grabbed his belt and whipped my hand. Instead of doing the normal kid thing and crying, I smiled. My dad looked at me very oddly. Then he asked me what was wrong. Nothing. I guess I just like the feeling of pain, I replied, like it was no big deal. They were so shocked that my mom almost fainted. She looked at me like a monster and took a step back while tears were falling out of her shocked eyes. She so overreacted. My dad was convinced that I was definitely ill, and they instantly rushed me to the hospital and demanded to see a doctor right away. It wasn't long before the doctor found out what was up with me. No, I wasn't ill. Instead, I was just a masochist. After that, my parents never struck me again. Instead, if I misbehaved, they'd take my phone or games console off me. They told me not to tell anyone that I liked pain, as other people wouldn't understand. I wasn't stupid. I'd already figured out that other people just didn't get it. There have been some occasions where I almost revealed my fondness for pain secret. One time, I accidentally closed my locker while my hand was still there. I was squealing happily and jumping around. 
One of my friends came to me and said, are you okay? I told them I was fine. I was just working through the pain. Then, one time in the school canteen, I had a run-in with this girl named Brittany who thought she was amazing because she was a cheerleader, when she was just a mean girl who sucked at the chair routines. She came up to me and started calling me bad names. I didn't care, as I get so excited when people roast me, but I pretended to get mad and I threw chocolate pudding at her cheerleader outfit. She flipped out and lunged at me. She actually put her hands around my throat. Do it harder, I coughed out to her. She stopped and told me I was crazy. Then she stormed off. The other kids were looking on in confusion. Then my one friend asked me if I was okay. I rubbed my eyes to make them look red, and I acted like I was upset. Things changed when I met Stanley. He works in my local coffee shop. One day, I was about to order my usual, but he'd already made it up for me, as well as my drink. He also passed me a napkin with his number on it. We started talking, and a few weeks after that, we became official boyfriend and girlfriend. I was so excited, as well as being worried. Stanley didn't know about my love of pain, and I didn't know how to tell him, as I didn't want to freak him out. One time I was around him, and I accidentally knocked over my glass of wine and cut my hand. I didn't flinch or wince, or anything. Instead, I just smiled. My behavior confused Stanley. As he cleaned up my hand, I knew I had to tell him my secret. Um, Stanley, you should probably know that I'm a masochist, which means I get a kick out of feeling pain. His jaw was wide open. I knew I shouldn't have said that. Now he's going to think I'm a weirdo. But surprisingly, he eventually said, Well, it's okay. You're just being yourself. That's what makes you special. And then he leaned over and kissed me. Wow. I knew he was amazing, but I didn't realize just how amazing. I was falling for the most perfect and understanding guy ever. A few weeks later, I was over at his place watching a romantic movie when I heard a knock at the door. Stanley quickly opened it, expecting to see the pizza delivery guy. But no. Instead, it was Brittany, the girl who picked a fight with me. Why did she come to Stanley's house? What is she doing at your house? She'd shouted. This was confusing, so I asked Stanley what was going on. Turns out, Brittany is his ex-girlfriend. This was shocking. How could he have dated that bimbo? Brittany started yelling at us. She said some pretty horrible things, but I just smiled at her. Then she picked up a photo frame and hurled it at me. It hit me in the face. It ached, but I just laughed, which made her even angrier. I'm gonna kill you, you freak. She lunged toward me. Stanley grabbed her around the waist and pulled her out of the house. Then he locked the door and called the police to report her. He asked me if I was okay. I was fine. In fact, it'd been an enjoyable experience, and I was giddy and giggly from it. Brittany got into serious trouble. She now stays out of my way and she knows if she messes with me, she'll end up with a restraining order and have to move schools. Unsurprisingly, I haven't had more trouble off her since, apart from the odd dirty look, but whatever. Thanks for listening to my story. I might like pain, and I know it's weird, but no matter with it, right? What do you think of my story? Do you feel pain just like me? Please leave a comment, as I'd love to read them. Hey. It's your girl Nicole, back again. So my mom couldn't deal with my truancy anymore, so she packed me off to live with my dad. The problem is, he's the principal of a snooty school that barely has any female students, and he forced me to attend it. The school needed to get with the times and be more female inclusive, so I started a girls only club called The Doll to get us noticed. It was all going well, but then dad let the news slip that I was his daughter. By first break, everyone in school knew who I was. Soon, kids who'd never spoken to me before were offering to help me with my homework, and the teachers seemed nervous around me. I get it. Nobody wanted to be seen quarreling with the principal's daughter. Even the grumpy canteen woman completely changed too. Now, she even gave me double portions of chicken. It sounded good, right? Nope. Instead, it was kinda annoying. Then on top of all this, 
my friends started doing crazy stuff behind my back. They put lipstick kisses on random lockers, snuck into the faculty room and set up a doll's tea party, and then they did the biggest prank of all. Yep, they actually went into the gym hall and hung up garlands of panties, bras, and tampons alongside a massive banner saying, Welcome to the girls' world. Wow, even I thought they'd gone too far with this one. My dad was fuming about it. I was terrified they'd get expelled. There were barely any girls in the school as it was, without me losing my only female classmates. But they ended up getting a week's worth of detentions and were made to stay behind after school and clean up the gym hall. Phew! The next day, my friends came up to me while I was at my locker, and Angela said, Detention sucks, but that prank was so worth it. Just wait till you see what we've got planned next. She winked. It's definitely going to be a washout. Carly chuckled. Enough was enough, so I told them to inform the rest of the doll to meet me in the gym after school. Okay, so I may have sneakily taken the gym's key out of my dad's pocket, but it was for the greater good. Now I had all of the doll together. I said what I needed to say. Hey girls, look, I know this school favors boys, and it's understandable you want to be seen, but all these pranks are making us look bad. I know my dad, and the only way he's going to listen to us is if we do something that gets across our point in an honorable way. So I'm going to run in the next student council election. Before I'd even finished my sentence, Carly said, but that position is only for the boys. So I replied, I think it's time we change that, don't you? So who's with me? To my surprise, all of the girls in the room raised their hands and cheered. After that, I launched my campaign. The two candidates with the highest number of votes would go through to the final round. At first, I didn't get much attention. But then, this wasn't surprising, as I was the only girl competing. The other competitors took it super seriously. One boy handed out free t-shirts with his name on them, and another stuck leaflets on everyone's locker, listing 10 reasons why he was the right person for the job. No way. I needed to come up with a plan. So, I came up with a familiar but extremely effective strategy called Beauty Trap. Ha! No boy could escape it. One of my main focuses was that I wanted to put the buzz back in the school and make it inclusive for all. So I took that one step further and me and my team dressed up as cute bees and handed out homemade black and yellow cupcakes. Then, whenever a boy spoke to us, we winked at them, handed them candy, and told them it was just for them because they were the cutest. And it worked. Of course. I made the final two, and it came down to me against Brandon, this super smart guy. So now all I needed to do was work on my presentation, which I'd give in the schoolyard. How boring it was. So a bright idea crossed my mind. Why didn't we combine the finals with a prom night where students could not only vote for the potential president, but also dress up and socialize. I told my team about my amazing idea, but to my surprise, they looked doubtful. The teachers will never let that happen. They are so anti-parties, it hurts, Carly said. You just leave this to me, I smirked. My dad may have been strict, but he was no match for me. So that night after dinner, I told him my plan. At first, he was so surprised and didn't agree as he said that we couldn't combine the election ceremony with a singing and dancing party, as it would take the dignity out of it. Ugh, my dad was stuck in the past. So I said, but dad, it'll be a good opportunity for all the students to hang out with each other. Me and my friends will decorate the hall, find a DJ, sort out the food and drink, and do everything else. I know you have your reservations, and I get that, but prom is an important event for us teenagers. We learned so much from them, how to dance, how to feel good about ourselves, how to mix with each other. Plus, we need this, and I promise I won't let anyone spike the punch. In fact, we won't even have punch. It took a lot more pleading and persuading, but eventually he sighed, then said, Fine, you can have your prom, but don't let me regret it. I squealed in excitement, then rushed over and hugged him. He looked shocked as thinking about it. This was the first time I'd hugged him in, well, years. I have to admit that it kind of felt good. 
I instantly messaged the group with my good news, and they replied with memes, love hearts, and dancing emojis. And the talk soon turned to what we were going to wear. See? Being friends with the daughter of the principal had many advantages, right? I'm not going to lie, organizing a prom was hard. But luckily for me, I have amazing friends who helped me all the way. Carly sorted out the decorations and found a DJ, and Angela was in charge of tickets. The night of the prom finally arrived, and wow, everyone scrubbed up well. The doll members gave a welcoming dance performance, then Brandon and I went up on stage to give our presentations. Brandon went first, and geez, he's Mr. Serious, but he is cute. He went on about improving the nutritional value of school meals, organizing more school trips for the chess, math, and sports clubs, and doing more to help the climate crisis, such as raising money, recycling, and producing solar energy to lower the school's carbon footprint. It sounded convincing, right? But it was a little bit boring. He was such a nerd. I'll bet a cute one and I had to pretend to itch my nose so I could secretly yawn. I heard clapping. Oh no, that meant it was my turn, and I wasn't prepared. The prom had taken up my time, and... Ugh, what should I say? That's when I looked over at my dad, who was standing at the back of the room, and I saw him nod at me. So, I took center stage and decided to let my heart do the talking. Hi, guys and girls. Some of you may know me as the rebel girl who stirred up trouble when I first arrived here, while others may just know me as the principal's daughter. The truth is, I'm just a normal student like the rest of you, one who had some major doubts about coming here. I could hear some people whispering in the crowd, but I kept calm and carried on. I didn't think I'd like it here, but it turns out I was wrong. I've made some amazing friends, and I've grown to really kind of like this place. However, the outdated attitude toward the female students frustrates me. Times have changed, and we belong here too. So, it's only right we have our own uniform, clubs tailored for us, and please, no more bench presses. Girls are just as good as boys, if not even better. For example, we, the awesome girls in the doll, set up this party all by ourselves. Together, let's make our high school life more brilliant and inclusive for all because this school has something special, and I want everyone to see that with a little care and attention, it can truly buzz. Wow, I'd done it. All of the students cheered and applauded. Even Brandon patted me on the shoulder and said, well done, your presentation was so convincing, you've got my vote. Then he winked at me. OMG, what did that mean? After that, I joined my friends on the dance floor and made the most of the amazing dance we'd organized. Finally, it was the results time. One of the teachers went on stage with the envelope containing the winner's name. Then, she opened it and said, With two-thirds of the votes, you've chosen your winner. And it's... Nicole. I couldn't believe it! I'd done it! I'd actually won! When I walked off the stage, Dad came over and hugged me tight. Then he said, Darling, I'm really proud of you. And that was it. Now I'm the president of the student council, and as I promised in my presentation, I'm making this school an inclusive place for all. Now we have more activities for girls, including a cheerleading club. Although, of course, boys can join too. We even have a girl's uniform, so I don't have to wear those hideous baggy pants anymore. Now... Everyone seems happier here, including me. Mom heard about my change in attitude and invited me to come back home. But I can't go back. I belong here in this school with my new friends. Maybe, just maybe, I do love this place after all. Who'd have thought it? It's crazy, huh? When I graduated college, I told myself I was going to be single for a while. My college romance had ended horribly. I discovered my boyfriend was cheating on me with my best friend. So when I landed my first teaching job, I decided I was just going to focus on my work. Well, that didn't last long. One of the other teachers who started at the same time as me, a guy called Brett, 
was drop dead gorgeous. I couldn't take my eyes off of him. And every time we had a staff meeting, I'd find myself daydreaming about him. I told all my friends and family about my vow not to date anyone for a while. But that didn't mean I couldn't flirt a little, right? After one of the meetings, I hung around and made a cup of coffee, and I noticed he was still there. I asked him if he'd like a cup too, and that's how we got chatting. Straight away, he asked me out, and that night, after we finished work, he picked me up and we went on a date. I told him I'd rather keep it a secret for now, as I didn't want all of our colleagues to find out just yet. Actually, I didn't want anybody to find out at all, as I was too embarrassed about breaking my promise not to date. Everything was going well. We'd meet in secret after work, and we even snuck into the cleaning cupboard at work for a few kisses sometimes. I didn't think anyone knew about us, but one day we came out from a kissing session and Laura, one of our colleagues, was standing there. I went bright red and ran off and tried to avoid her for the rest of the week. But when I was walking to my car at the end of work on Friday, she came running after me. She said she had something to tell me about Brett, and I froze. I'd be heartbroken if Brett was cheating on me. But what Laura told me was the opposite of this. She said she'd overheard him on the phone talking to someone about how he was going to propose soon. I couldn't believe it. We'd not even been dating one month. I wasn't ready for this. I was supposed to meet him later that night for a date, but I didn't show up. He tried calling me and texting me dozens of times, but I just ignored him. How could he propose already? Was he crazy? I mean, I liked him, but not enough to marry him already. The whole weekend, I stayed at home, and eventually the calls stopped. He must have realized we were moving too fast. On the Monday, I felt nervous about seeing him at work, so I called in sick. That morning, my phone rang. It was Lara. She said Brett had quit his job. He hadn't shown up. He just emailed the school. What? I felt so bad. Had I hurt him that much that he felt he had to quit his job? The next day when I went in, everyone was kind of quiet. It had clearly come as a shock. Brett was a brilliant teacher. I seriously just didn't hear from him again. It's like he had disappeared. The rest of the semester was really hard. I could hear people whispering about me, and one day I even walked into the canteen and two other teachers were saying it was my fault that Brett had left. I felt so hurt when I heard that. The only person I could speak to about it was Lara, and she suggested I move to another school and start afresh. She said it was clear I was super sad about it all, and maybe the change would help. I thought about it that night and decided she was right. The next week, she came over to me and she said she had some good news. She'd just seen an international school in Mexico was looking for new teachers urgently, and she said I would be perfect for the job. I'd always wanted to teach abroad, plus my Spanish was pretty good. So what did I have to lose? I sent in my application and I didn't have to wait long. The very next day, I got an email saying the job was mine and when could I start. During a month, I found myself packing up my life and moving to Mexico. I was excited. It was time to leave the past behind and start a new adventure. On my first day at the new school, I was super nervous. I was shown around by the principal of the school, and then he said later that morning I'd be introduced to the other teachers. It seemed like such a great school, and I couldn't wait to start teaching. I sat with the principal and waited for all of the teachers to arrive. It seemed like everyone was there, but the principal said we were just waiting for one. When he walked through the door, I thought I was going to faint. It was Brett. At first, he didn't see me, and he walked in laughing and apologizing for being late, saying his wife had missed the bus and that he'd had to drive her to work. His wife? And then I saw the ring on his finger. I started shaking. How could this be happening? I kept my head down, but it was too late. 
The principal introduced me, and I saw Brett's face turn beetroot red. It was super awkward. I pretended not to know him, and he did the same. Then I had to spend the whole day waiting to get an opportunity to speak to him. Finally, at the end of the day, I found him standing outside drinking a cup of coffee. I walked up to him, and before I could even speak, he just kept apologizing. He said it was wrong to have dated me when he was already engaged to someone else, and that when I'd ignored him that weekend, he thought I'd found out about his fiance. I told him I thought he was going to propose to me because Lara had heard him on the phone and that I'd freaked out. And suddenly he said, Lara? Then he asked if that was why I'd taken this job. Turns out, Brett had told Lara he was working at this school. And for some reason, Lara thought it would be a good way to reunite us both. Little did she know, he was actually already married to someone else. Oh my gosh, this was such a crazy misunderstanding. And now, I don't know what to do. Should I go back to the U.S. and pretend this never happened? Or keep working in Mexico and try to be friends with Brett? What if his wife finds out he cheated on her with me? I'm just as bad as my ex-boyfriend from college now. I opened the drawer and, aha, uh -huh, there it was. I'd been looking for this magazine for ages. But as I closed the drawer, I noticed something else. A photo hiding under the magazine. There was a woman and two kids in the photo. A boy and a girl. I was so confused. Hmm, who were they? I turned it over and there was a message on the back that said, This is my new number. Call me more often. I miss you so much. Suddenly my mom came in and I was about to ask her about the photo, but she got mad and started screaming at me to get out of the room. Never, ever come into our room again. Do you hear me, Erin? We have private stuff in here. You know the rules. I, I was just looking for the magazine, I said, and quickly tucked the photo inside before running out of her room. Actually... I knew I wasn't meant to go in my parents' room, but I was doing a school essay on sustainability, and I'd seen an article in my mom's magazine about it a few days back. So, I'd searched the whole house to try and find it. Eventually, I knew the only place it could be was their room. So I snuck in. Usually, their door was locked, so I was in luck. Ever since I was a kid, I had been forbidden to go in there, but I had no idea why. Back in my room, I couldn't stop staring at the photo. Were these my relatives or something? Long-lost cousins? The boy in the pic looked totally like my dad. Oh no. Reading the note behind it again, suddenly I thought this could be another family of my dad. Do you know what I meant? Yes. What if my dad had a secret family? Maybe he'd cheated on my mom and had this whole other secret life. My inner detective was going crazy. There was nothing else for it. I had to get to the bottom of this and find out the truth. I searched online for the phone number and couldn't believe it when a girl the same age as me popped up. I started scrolling through all her photos and suddenly saw one of a young guy holding a baby and the caption said, Miss the old days of being daddy's little girl. This was insane! I was certain the young guy in the photo was my dad and I needed to talk to the girl ASAP. I messaged her and told her we were related. I even sent some photos of me taken with my dad to prove it. I was shaking when I saw her reply pop up. My dad never mentioned you. Not even once. That hurt me so much. I couldn't believe this girl was actually my dad's daughter too. Now, how am I supposed to break this news to mom? She'd freak out. I couldn't bear the thought of seeing this crush her. So, I decided to go clear things up myself first. A few days later, my dad was going on a business trip to Boston. Again. He was always going to Boston. I'd always believed he was just super busy at work. But now I knew the truth as my dad's secret daughter had confirmed she was also from Boston. I mean, of course she was. So I told my mom I was going to spend the weekend at my friend's house. And the moment my dad left, I jumped in a cab that I'd called and asked the driver to follow him. 
When we got to Boston, I saw my dad stop outside of a house and then glance around as if he thought he was about to get caught. Then he got out of his car and rang the doorbell. A woman came to open and immediately they started kissing. Then a young girl appeared and, yep, it was exactly the people in the photo. I was shaking so much, I actually dropped the money for the cab. It felt like my dad had punched me in the chest. I was so upset. He had this whole other family that mom and I had no clue about. I couldn't stand it anymore. Mom didn't deserve this. I walked towards the house and was so focused on what I was planning to say to my dad, I didn't even notice a van pulling up right next to me. Suddenly, everything went black, and I realized I had been blindfolded. A huge hand was covering my mouth so I couldn't even scream. I felt tape being put across my lips, sealing them shut. Then someone yanked me backwards and shoved me into some kind of car. Oh my god, was I being kidnapped? Why? Had my dad seen me and now he was trying to cover his tracks? This was like something out of a movie. They even tied me up. After what felt like a billion hours, we finally stopped and I was dragged out of the car into a cold, dark building. Someone took my blindfold off, but it was so dark inside I couldn't really see anything except a single light bulb above my head. The tape across my mouth was pulled off and I was untied. I wanted to run out of there as fast as possible, but I was terrified. Two men dressed in black were standing in the room and one of them glared at me and said, They think they can hide you forever? <laughs> Who are you? I shouted. Where am I? If it's money you want, call my dad. Please just let me go, I said in what must have been the shakiest voice ever. Don't worry, we're not going to hurt you. We don't even need money. It's your parents we want. In three weeks, they'll be out of prison. And then they'll need to come here to get you back. Then we can really punish you for knowing too many secrets about us. I had no idea what they were talking about. Prison? My parents aren't in prison. You've got the wrong person. One of the men just laughed and said, It's been 12 years, and yet you still don't know about it. Then he walked off laughing his head off. What? What were they talking about? None of this made any sense. My dad was a businessman, and my mom was a housewife. This was all some big mix-up. It had to be. They'd locked me in that dark room. I tried to scream and bang on the door, but no one heard me. Or if they did, they didn't care. The next few days were some of the worst of my life. I didn't think I'd survive. Twice a day someone slipped food under the door, and I spent most of the time trying to think of ways to escape. There was no window, but there was a small air vent, and if I could just open it, I thought I might be able to crawl through and get the heck out of this disgusting, shabby place. Lucky for me, they'd given me a fork to eat with, and slowly I'd been using it to loosen the screws on the grid of the vent. Finally, on the third night, I waited until everything was dead quiet, and I got into the vent. I crawled through and managed to get out. I was at the back of some old abandoned warehouse. And as I stood up to stretch my legs, someone covered my mouth from behind. Oh, no! How had I got caught so quickly? But then I heard a voice. Shh, are you okay? I almost screamed. <gasps> it was my mom. How did you find me? I asked. But she just grabbed my hand and said, Let's get out of here. Then I'll explain. We climbed through a small gap in the fence, and then I saw a black car by the road. I started to panic again, but my mom told me it was for us. And then, as we climbed in, she said to the driver, I got her, James. Let's go. It was only then that I finally took a look at my mom and realized what she was wearing. She was in all black and looked like a spy or something. Um, Mom, what's going on? My mom bit her lip and said she couldn't hide it from me anymore. What she told me next was unbelievable. Turns out my parents weren't even my real parents. My biological mom and dad used to be members of this mob, but 12 years ago they'd been given an impossible task and they refused to do it, so their boss said he'd harm me as their punishment. My parents had no choice but to turn themselves in and ask the police for protection for me. In return, they gave the police some confidential info about the mob. Whoa, I was shocked. So, you're not my mom? My real parents are in prison? I felt like my head was spinning. How could my life get so crazy? Yep, they're in prison. 
Back then, the police stormed into the mob's headquarters, but the boss had managed to escape. That's why we put you in the protection program, because we knew he'd come search for you. This was too much. I didn't want such a dramatic life. Then I suddenly remembered there was more drama. Mom, um, I found out Dad was cheating on you, so I followed him here to Boston. Did you follow him too? I mean, how did you find me? This was so weird. My mom didn't look sad at all. She said, actually, he wasn't cheating. That woman and those kids are his family. You see, at the time, he and I were the only two people qualified enough to adopt you. So he actually left his family to fake our family life to protect you. It was all part of the protection program. But he missed his family so much. That's why he went back to see them most weekends. I'm so sorry, Aaron. We didn't expect it to turn out like this. When you didn't come home on Sunday, I used the GPS we set on your phone. And that's how I found you. Okay, my head was spinning even more. Not only were they not my real parents, they weren't even a real couple. This was absolute insanity, and all to protect me? Wow. And as it turns out, it worked out pretty well, because by tracking me, they found the new boss's hideout, and now the police had arrived, and he was finally being arrested. As for me and my family, we had to pretend to be a real family. For now. And actually, it wasn't that hard, because I loved them so much, and they'd sacrificed the past 12 years of their life to protect me. I'd be eternally grateful to them, and my biological parents would be out of prison soon, and then I'd be reunited with them. I don't remember anything about them, but they also sacrificed their lives to protect me, so they must be pretty amazing, right? Rules, rules, rules. Moms sure do love dishing them out, don't they? I'm Nicole, by the way. And you see, my parents divorced when I was eight, so since then, it's just been me and mom. Mom laid down a bunch of boring rules for me, but I hate following them. I'm 18, and I should be out having fun, right? To me, rules were made to be broken anyway. And trust me, I broke them. Only, this led to my whole life changing. One day, I had an important math test, but I hate math. So, I skipped school and went to the movies with my friends instead. I mean, hello? The last Avengers movie had just come out. No way was I missing it and getting spoilers. Maybe mom would give me a detention for a few weeks, but it's no big deal, right? I arrived home to find mom waiting for me. She glared at me and said, Nicole, I received an interesting phone call from the school. It turns out you haven't been there all day. So, where have you been? Oh no, busted! I just shrugged and replied, out. It's those friends of yours, isn't it? They are a bad influence. I walked off to my room. Nicole, come back here and talk. She shouted after me, but I ignored her. Then she yelled out, I can't stand you and your childish attitude anymore. You're going to live with your dad. What? She was kicking me out. Wow, I didn't expect her to do that. Whatever. I was sick of being moaned at all the time. Surely dad would be far more understanding. I hadn't seen dad all that much. In fact, the last time was, um, I think it was my 16th birthday. He was a busy man, as he's the principal at this snooty boy school. And mom wasn't kidding. She called him up, and that evening, he showed up and loaded my stuff into the trunk of his car. It felt super awkward. I had no idea what to say to him. Then, about an hour into the seriously tedious journey, he said, I completed all the admission procedures for you, so you can start learning in my school tomorrow. What? It was an all-boys school, and I was a girl. Besides, no way was I studying somewhere where my dad was the principal. Panicked, I asked, but dad, isn't it an all-boys school? He said, it used to be, but of late... We've let a few female students in. I can't go there. You're the principal. It'll be so embarrassing. No way. I'll go to another school or something. He gave me a strict look and said, Mom told me all about your behavior in your old school and it's unacceptable. So, you'll be learning at my school so I can keep an eye on you. This is not up for debate. OMG, I can't believe it. He was much stricter than Mom. 
so reluctantly I muttered out, Fine, but only if you promise not to tell anyone I'm your daughter. He nodded and said, Okay, if that's what you want. The school was like something out of one of those weird movies. You know, where the characters think they're safe, but then start disappearing one by one? For starters, it was situated on a hill, miles from anything else. Inside, well, it was so masculine. Browns and greys, and I didn't see one picture in the entire building. The only female thing in the whole place was the girls' restroom. We had to share everything else with the boys. Talk about an inconvenience. The uniform was the same for boys and girls. An oversized shirt and baggy pants and these gross flat shoes. Yuck! During P.E., girls were forced to do the same workout as the boys. Bench presses, push-ups, and playing soccer is not my idea of fun. Ugh! And there wasn't even a cheerleading squad. Then, there were all these extra dumb rules for the girls, like only uniforms are allowed at school, no skirt, no dress, not even jeans. Do the top button of your shirt up. Tie your hair up into this ugly bun. No flirting with the boys. Yep, that was actually a rule. Can you believe this place? I didn't know whether this was a high school or a prison. I thought this was bad, but I soon realized this school had a major problem. Maybe it's because this school was originally boys only, but man, this place didn't appreciate girls at all. Once in a history class, the teacher asked us what year Abraham Lincoln became president. Easy. But before I could even raise my hand, she continued, This question seemed too hard for girls, so do any of the boys know the answer? What? How could she say that? What was with her male chauvinist attitude? This put me in a bad mood, so during dinner, I decided to moan to dad about it. He needed to know how ridiculous his school was. So I told him how I hated his dumb rules and how sexist the teachers were. He glared at me and told me that there weren't enough girls at the school to warrant a separate uniform. Moreover, if girls dressed up, it would only cause distractions for the boys. As for the history teacher, it was just because boys often have larger knowledge than girls on this matter. So maybe she just didn't want to embarrass the girls in case they couldn't give out the right answer. Ha! Huh, what kind of argument was this? It wasn't the olden days. Jeez, these oldies needed to get with the decade. Okay, fine. I'll prove to the whole school and all the teachers that there weren't only boys here. The next day, I gathered all the girls from my class. Um, in fact, there were only two of them, Angela and Carly, and we met up in the only girly place, the girls' restroom. Then I told them, Hey girls, welcome to our club, The Doll. I think it's about time we fought for our rights and presence in this school. As girls matter too, right? At first, they both seemed worried. I get it, they didn't want to get in trouble. But I soon managed to convince them that it'd be fine. Fun even. So they came around and agreed. First up, it was time to do something about this awful uniform. We tied up our shirts to expose our waists, and I helped the others put subtle makeup on, so our skin looked like it had a natural glow to it. Then, we all put glittery hair accessories and colorful scrunchies in our hair to jazz up our updos. Carly looked in the mirror and said, Okay, maybe our uniform isn't so bad. And we all burst out laughing. Now, it was time to make an entrance. We all walked along the corridor together. All the boys and girls turned around to look at us with admiring eyes and open mouths. One boy even dropped his stack of books on the floor and another one walked into his locker. Ha! The charm of girls was absolutely irresistible, right? Soon, we became a popular group around the school. The boys wanted to talk to us, and girls from other classes also joined our group, and I showed them how to style up their uniforms. It's great, right? Yep, there's a problem. The teachers were old fogies who didn't appreciate style. One day, before class, one teacher came up to me and my friends and accused us of ruining the dignity of the uniform and of exerting negative influences on other students. So I told her, we aren't violating any of the school's previous rules. We wear the uniform, we keep our top button done up, and we have the regulation hairstyle. Dressing up is a girl's prerogative. Besides, if boys are distracted, it's their fault. 
not ours, so you can't blame us for that. After that, I seemed to become a thorn in the side of all the teachers. In every subject, I would always be asked to answer the most difficult questions. And, of course, I didn't know the right answer. I mean, nobody knew it. And then they would give me a gloating look. Ugh, how childish they were. Another time, I was in the lunch queue, and when it was my turn, I chose barbecue chicken drumsticks, as they're my favorite. However, to my surprise, the canteen service said there was no chicken left, then put this weird oatmeal slop on my plate. Ew! I could see there were loads of chicken left, so why was she being so unreasonable? I skipped the gross slop, so as soon as I got home from school, I was so hungry, so I made myself a huge bowl of noodles. Dad saw me devouring the food, then smiled and asked, Has causing trouble at school all day made you that hungry? In between my mouthfuls of food, I told him what had happened with the teacher, and in the canteen. He just smiled and said it was because I was too stubborn. What kind of an excuse was that? I mean, when was starving students a good idea? The next morning, I drowsily walked into class and sat down at my desk. That's when I realized... I'd forgotten my phone. Well, this totally sucked, so I moaned to Angela. These teachers make my life a misery, and now I don't even have my phone. Today's going to be a long one. Suddenly, someone knocked on my desk. I looked up and saw my dad, aka the principal, standing there in front of me. I was so surprised that before I could say anything, he said, Hey, Cupcake, you left your phone at home. Oh, and I brought you breakfast, as you know how grumpy you get when you're hungry. Then he put my phone and a sandwich on my desk, stroked my hair, then left. What was he doing? Did he forget his promise? Needless to say, my classmates looked shocked. Angela stared at me and said, Huh? The principal is your dad? Unbelievable! Why didn't you tell us? I sat there open-mouthed. This was the most awkward thing ever. Thanks a lot, Dad. But little did I know, that was just the start of a new chapter of craziness. Things were about to get even worse. And oh boy, you wouldn't want to miss out on that. So everyone loves Christmas, right? Trust me. It's not so great when your boss fires you in November. How was I supposed to buy presents now? Still, I tried to see the positives. I hated that boring, underpaid, overworked job anyway. My ex-boss Adrian was the worst. He's a crazy perfectionist who always gave me ridiculous deadlines, complained about every tiniest mistake, and flipped out if things didn't go his way. No wonder he was still single at 32. Who could ever stand him? I wouldn't miss him, or my tragic ass-kissing co-workers. Anyways, on the bright side, I'd get to spend the entire holiday season with my family and my boyfriend Matt in peace, without being bothered by any annoying work emails. I, in fact, have invited Matt over for Thanksgiving dinner with my parents, and plan to spend this cozy weekend with my loved ones. Then, the day before Thanksgiving, I packed up my car and was about to go and pick Matt up when my phone beeped. Sonia. I don't think Thanksgiving is a good idea. I just think we need some time apart. Hope you have a great time. See you around. X. What? Had he just broken up with me over text message? I immediately rang him up, but he turned his phone off. Just great. Here I was, stuck at home for the entire Thanksgiving and Christmas period, being a jobless, boyfriendless loser. To make it worse, even my little sister Gina had a boyfriend who adored her. This is so unfair. One night, my parents were out to buy a Christmas tree, and Gina had her boyfriend over to help put up Christmas lights and decorations. Well, needless to say, love was in the air, and that festive vibe didn't help at all with my misery. So, I refused to join them and curled up in my room. Feeling so lonely and miserable, I downloaded Tinder. I usually wasn't one for dating apps, but I was feeling so low, I would have happily spoken to anyone. I didn't feel like being me. I was sick of being me, so I used the fake name Crystal and just put some artsy scenery pictures up. I could be whoever I wanted to be. And you know what? It seemed to be working, as a few guys wanted to talk to me. Okay, 
most of them were also bored, or only after one thing, but then there's this guy called Carl that caught my attention. Like me, he had no pictures of himself, but instead, he had images of song lyrics and movie quotes, including the quote, The more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. I love the movie Lost in Translation, so I sent him a message telling him he had good taste in films, and he messaged me back complimenting the scenery photos I took. After that, we started chatting days and nights. We talked about everything, from the dumb to the meaningful. He actually helped me out a lot and made the Christmas period bearable for me. It was all going great, until Christmas Eve. He sent me a message to wish me a Merry Christmas, along with, let's meet up for a drink. Oh no. Even though the app said he was only a few miles away, I wasn't ready for meetups. I actually was nervous upon reading his text. My heart was pounding, and I found myself worrying about what he would think of me when we met. What if he didn't look like what I imagined? What if he'd be disappointed when he saw me? Why does that even matter, though? Unless... I developed feelings for him. I don't even know anymore. But it's certain that I couldn't face him just yet. I politely refused his invitation. He was cool about it. Then we still continued to talk like normal. I survived Christmas. And then for New Year's Eve, Gina persuaded me to go to a party with her boyfriend and friends. I wasn't really keen to join, but I guessed I needed to do something to stop this gloominess. As I was walking in, I was so busy brushing off the snow on my shoulder that I bumped into a guy. To my horror, I looked up and saw that it was my old boss, Adrian. Why was he here, in my hometown? He was also shocked, but managed to smile at me. But I just gave him a glare, rolled my eyes, flipped back my hair, then strode off. What a mood killer! I grabbed a drink and sat in the corner in an attempt to avoid bumping into Adrian again. Gina found me and tried dragging me onto the dance floor, but I refused. Then she winked at me and in a tipsy voice said, You need a man to dance with. I'll be right back. Five minutes later, she excitedly waved at me and shouted over, Found one! I just want to facepalm as I saw her dragging Adrian by the hand over to me. Talk about awkward. But still, I mumbled out a high, downed a shot for courage, and then chatted to him. Okay, it turns out he was visiting his grandparents who lived around here, and he was actually an okay guy to talk to. After I spent most of the night talking to him, he bought a drink, then said to me, I have to admit that after the death stare you gave me on entry, I was afraid for my life. But it turns out, I've enjoyed chatting with you. Sorry, I blushed. No, it's okay. I'd be mad with me too if I were you. Letting you go from work was nothing personal. I had to let one person go, and I only chose you because I knew you were wasted there. Um, thanks, I guess, I laughed. Let's get another shot. Okay, so maybe Adrian wasn't that bad of a person after all. And I don't know if it's because of all the drinks we downed, the atmosphere, or the fact that everyone else around us was sharing New Year's kisses, that I almost felt like Adrian looked like he wanted to kiss me on the strike of midnight too. And I too didn't dodge it. Luckily, nothing happened. I mean, that would have been weird, right? The next day, Adrian messaged me, saying he would help me set up a job interview at a big media company. Wow, that's amazing! Now I had no excuse to sulk around anymore. I needed to get back to the city and sort my life out. Only, I still couldn't get Carl out of my head. I guessed these feelings were real. To clear up my mind, I decided to confess to him online. But then he messaged me back saying, I think you're great and I love talking to you, but I have a crush on my coworker. I'm sorry, but I'd like to stay friends. Ouch! Rejection hurt! Back in the city, I felt lonelier than ever. Yes, I'd got the new job and it was going well, but I was sick of seeing loved up couples everywhere. To make it worse, Gina came to stay with me for a while and she's always on the phone, giggling and FaceTiming her boyfriend. Now I couldn't even escape lovebirds in my own apartment. Feeling down, I messaged Carl again, just casually asked him to meet up later this weekend when I would be back home again for my mom's birthday. Well, to be honest, I just couldn't give him up just yet. Maybe he would change his mind when we met? Or I would be able to get over him once we meet? But he made up some excuse to reject me again! That was it, I told myself. It's official over now. Depressed, I called Adrian up for a drink. He arrived looking kinda cute, but the sting of rejection was still on my mind. I confided to Adrian, and I asked him if he thought Carl was a fool for turning me down? 
Adrian slammed his drink onto the table and turned to me and said, You're the fool. Why are you stupidly chasing after some guy online? He might not even be real. He might be some 60-year-old pervert. Why won't you just open your eyes and look in front of you? Then he stood up, locked me in his arms, and tried to kiss me. What? I was so mad I pulled myself away from him and slapped him straight across the face before I stomped off. He was meant to be my friend, not some guy after just one thing. I was so hurt, I cried while texting Carl about what just happened, but he didn't reply. The next day, I woke up with a pounding head and puffy eyes. I checked my phone. Adrian had called me, but nothing from Carl. He must have been too busy with his coworker, huh? Suddenly, I heard the door knock. My sister answered it and told me it was Adrian. I reluctantly went out to see him. I mean, I guess I needed to at least hear him out. He was standing there looking sheepish as he said, I'm so sorry about last night, Sonia. I was slightly drunk and I guess I've read the signals wrong. For what it's worth, I think that Carl guy is a fool for letting you go. You're amazing. I wasn't in the mood to talk to him, so said it was fine, then told him to leave. I closed the door and threw myself on the sofa. Then about ten minutes later, there was someone at the door again. I answered it, and there was Adrian, but this time, he changed his outfit. Confused, I grumbled, what else do you want? Then, he politely greeted me. Hello, Crystal. Let me introduce myself. I'm Carl. We've been talking for months. I guess, if you think about it, the more you know who you are, and what you want, the less you let things upset you. I stared at him open-mouthed. He just quoted Lost in Translation, and he'd called me Crystal. Then, reality struck me. OMG! All this time, and Adrian was Carl? I dragged him inside. We sat down on the sofa and talked everything out. It's so unreal! Turns out the guy I've been chasing after is literally right in front of me. How ironic! I was so happy I hugged him and broke down crying, apologizing. Right then, my sister walked out from the kitchen, took one look at us, and laughed out, Well, 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 isn't this the awful boss who fired you? But most importantly, isn't he the guy I brought to you at the New Year's Eve party? You two owe me big time. We all burst out laughing. So, yeah, after a horrid holiday season, now I finally could start a promising new year with a great job and a pretty awesome new boyfriend. I guess things always have a way of working out in the end, right? Thank you for listening to my story, and wish you guys a good start into the new year! Oh my sweet little Jake, I'm glad you're back. I missed you so much. These were the first few words I heard from my mom after a seriously long sleep. But why couldn't I move my body? Oh my God, was I paralyzed? A doctor appeared and told me everything. Oh Jesus, I'd been in a coma for five months. Yeah, you heard me right. Not five days, not five weeks, but five freaking months. The good news was that I wasn't paralyzed. I just needed some therapy to strengthen my muscles. So you're probably wondering how I ended up in a coma. Me too. So I asked my mom. Sweetie, you had your headphones on and you were singing along to some tune. You were so loud I could hear you outside while I was gardening. So I waved at you to quiet down, but you tripped over your sneakers, fell out the window, and knocked your head on the flower pot. What? That was so dumb. Why couldn't it have been something cool like I took on a mugger or tackled a shark or something, huh? Anyway, therapy became the norm for me. But where were my dad, my girlfriend Jenny, and my best friend Ben? None of them visited me, not even once. And they were all ignoring my calls and messages. I asked mom about it and she told me dad was on a business trip. Ben had moved towns and I'd already broken up with Jenny before the coma. Huh? We'd broken up? That couldn't be. I didn't remember us breaking up. In fact, the last thing I do remember was sending her a cheesy meme of a cat and telling her she was perfect. <laughs> Boy, this sucked. Finally, I was discharged from the hospital. My first stop was Jenny's house. I pounded on the door and eventually she stuck her head out and said, J Jake, you're awake. Yeah, exactly. I'm awake. I asked her why we'd split up and she shook her head and told me we hadn't. 
The only reason she hadn't answered my calls was that she thought it was a joke. Then she told me to go home, as she was busy at the moment. And then she closed the door on me. Weird. But at least we hadn't broken up. Maybe she was nervous. Oh, and she wanted to do her hair and makeup to look pretty in my eyes. Well, that must be it. It made total sense now. <laughs> Girls are weird sometimes. So I had school tomorrow, but I knew I needed to catch up on the happenings of the world first. So I went online and did some research. What? Pass me the tissues as I was about to cry. My favorite TV show, Supernatural, was over. For real this time? Oh my god. After 15 years, how could they? Oh wow, there was more. Trump wasn't the president anymore. And what's with all this dancing on TikTok? It all gave me a headache, so I went to bed. The next morning at school, I walked into class. And everyone rushed over to me and hugged me and high-fived me. Well, except for Ben. Jeez, talk about a lousy friend. But hang on, wasn't he of meant to move towns? So having my charm, good looks, sporting talents, and the hottest girlfriend in the school made me a super popular guy. No wonder everyone seemed so delighted to see me. It was good to be back. But then my teacher arrived, glared at me, and told me I was in the wrong class. I'd been pushed back to junior year because I'd missed too much school. What? I couldn't graduate with my classmates? Bummer. I sat down with these juniors and oh god. It looked like Dwayne The Rock Johnson was sitting in a kindergarten class. They all look like little kids in comparison to me. I've never been so relieved for lunch break in all my life. I hurried to the canteen and saw Jenny, so I hugged her from behind. Huh? Why did she have a balloon under her shirt? I stared at her belly in shock. Yup, my girl was pregnant. She burst into tears and started apologizing. The room started to spin and before I knew it, I'd fainted. I woke up in the hospital. Again. I was seriously getting sick of this place. The doctor said I should take it easy and avoid stress at any cost. Oh well, I just found out my girlfriend was pregnant after I woke up from a freaking coma. Tell me how am I supposed to not be stressed now? After that, mom took me home. Dad was there. It was so good to see him. I hugged him, but he gave me this awkward look and told me he was only there to pick up some things. Huh? Where was he going now? And that's when my parents told me the shocking news. They were divorced. What? I mean, I knew they argued sometimes, but this was absurd. Something must have happened while I was in a coma. And what's with my dad's attitude? He barely looked at me. This was weird. It felt like I'd woken up from my coma in a parallel universe or something. Little did I know that it was about to get a lot crazier. The next day at school, I saw Ben's car pull up in front of the entrance. Then he opened the passenger door and helped Jenny get out. Oh, hell no. Now everything was clear. I ran toward them and did a Mortal Kombat punch right in Ben's nose. Damn, it felt good. But it did land us both in detention. I had to sit in a room with that jerk for an entire hour. I couldn't hold it in anymore and needed to confront him. He just shrugged and replied, We thought you were never going to wake up again. Jenny was devastated, so I took care of her for you. Was he serious? He took care of her by getting her pregnant? Huh, great job, buddy. There was no way I was ever talking to him again, and I was kicking him out of the basketball team. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that I'm the captain. The next day I strolled into practice and shouted, Yo, your captain's back, and he will lead this team to victory. I expected cheers, but nope. They all stayed quiet and stared down at their feet. Then the coach came over and told me I was off the team for a whole six months. Doctor's orders. And guess who the new captain was? Yeah. No other than my amigo, Ben. Let me get this straight. I was in a coma, so my best pal Ben over here stole not only my girl, but also my position as captain? Wow. Someone put me back in my coma, please, thanks, because this life sucks. No wonder my mom told me he'd moved away. I wish he had. I was so mad and I needed to talk to somebody, so I went to my dad's house. I was about to knock on the door when I heard voices between my dad and a woman coming from inside the house. I sneaked over to the window and started to film them on my phone. But wait a minute. This wasn't some random chick. It was Jenny. We can't hide this from Jake forever. Nonsense. He'll never find out unless you tell him, so keep up the act. Here's the money for this month. Now go. Oh. My. God. I couldn't believe it. Okay, let me put all the pieces together. My dad had an affair with Jenny and the baby was his. So my mom found out and divorced him. Then she lied to protect me. But dad didn't want the baby, so Jenny tricked Ben into believing it was his. Now everything makes sense. Luckily, I had the footage of his traitorous antics. So it was time to threaten him with it. 
After all, being a local politician, the last thing he would want was for this to get out. I set up a fake email and attached the video with the message, I know your dirty secret and I'm going to make you pay. He immediately replied that he would pay me $10,000 for the footage. I told him to meet me in the park at midnight to discuss it. I also sent the video to Jenny and told her that unless she wanted this to go viral, she had to go to the park. I got there early and spent a couple hours hiding in a bush while I waited for them. They looked surprised when they saw each other, but nothing prepared them for me hobbling out of the bush. Ouch, leg cramp, and saying, Well, what do we have here? My dearest father and my loving girlfriend having a baby together. I took my phone out and continued. How could you do this to me and mom? I thought it's only right the world get to see this and learn what you're really like. My dad begged me to stop, but I was so mad. So mad that I was about to upload it from my phone when Jenny suddenly shouted. Will you just tell him the truth already? Oh God, there was more? My dad sighed and began to tell me everything. Brace yourselves, it's more dramatic than a soap opera. My parents didn't divorce because of Jenny. They had issues for a while but only stayed together for me. So without me around, they split for good. But dad wasn't having a fair. The baby wasn't his and it wasn't Ben's either. Nope, it was mine. But dad knew his son becoming a dad at such a young age would look bad for his career. So he was paying Jenny to fool Ben into thinking it was his baby. Oh my God, these people were mad. This was too much to deal with, so I ran out of there. I locked myself away in my room and tried to figure it all out. The coma had been bad. But the worst part of it all was that the people I cared about most in the world betrayed and lied to me. The next day, Jenny came to my house and asked if we could get back together. Of course I agreed. Ha! Just kidding. My actual answer was, hell no, not in a million years. I mean, come on, let's do the math, shall we? First, she left me for money, and second, she had an affair with my best friend. We were over for good, but I will continue to support her and always be there for our kid. Ben tried talking to me a few times, but I don't want to hear anything he has to say. There's no way I'm ever being friends with that lying jerk ever again. I'm still annoyed that mom lied to me, but I guess I don't blame her. She did it with the best intentions. And she just wanted to protect me. Besides, when the going got tough, she was the only one who stayed by my side. As for dad, it's going to take a long time for me to fully forgive him, but I'm trying. I mean, he did some pretty awful things, but at the end of the day, he's still my dad. So that's pretty much it. Crazy, right? A coma took everything from me, but also revealed the true faces of the people around me. Now I've decided to follow two rules in my life. One, be extra careful of who I put my trust in. And two, never sing near an open window ever again. I got really lucky in high school. I became super close with a girl called Sadie, and we did everything together. Up until then, I'd never really had a close friend, so I couldn't believe it when we met and just clicked. People even joked we were lesbians, but our friendship wasn't like that. She just got me. I finally felt understood, and I wondered where she'd been all my life. When it was time to apply for university, of course we applied to exactly the same ones, and even the same major. It was kind of funny because when I first met Sadie, she thought biochemistry was the most boring subject in the world. But as soon as I told her it was what I was planning to study, she quickly changed her tune and applied too. We didn't want to be apart, even for a second. In the first year of university, we were working on a project and Sadie and I got teamed up with a really cute guy. His name was Jordan. And pretty soon, the three of us were like the three musketeers. We started hanging out a lot, and one night, we were in the library studying, and I couldn't stop looking at Jordan. Every time I looked up, he was looking at me. I suddenly felt so attracted to him, and it was clear that there was a lot of chemistry between us. That same night, he sent me a message telling me he liked me, and I was so happy. After that night, Jordan and I started hanging out even more. If the three of us were together, Jordan would always sit next to me, and he'd even hold my hand under the table. Clearly, we were becoming a couple, and everyone knew it, even Sadie. But she started acting weird. She always seemed to find a reason to get in between me and Jordan. One time, she was supposed to be babysitting her nephew, but when she found out Jordan and I were working together in the lab, she told her sister she was sick and couldn't babysit. And then she just stayed with us. It was actually kind of awkward because we never got any alone time. 
Even when we went to the movies, Sadie would always turn up. One night, we were watching a horror movie, and she was so scared, she asked if she could sit in the middle of us. Honestly, it was starting to annoy me. I tried to talk to her about it, but she always made jokes and changed the subject. Then, things got really weird when we took a camping trip one weekend. Jordan and I had been planning it for ages, a romantic weekend away. We decided to take his motorbike and made a joke with Sadie that the motorbike couldn't carry three on it. But you won't believe it. When we got to the campsite, she was there. She'd paid a ton of cash and taken a taxi there. Great. So now we had a third wheel the whole weekend. Don't get me wrong. Sadie was my best friend, and she was just as important to me as Jordan. But sometimes, you just want private time with your boyfriend. On that trip, I brought my Polaroid camera. Jordan and I took a photo together, and I kissed him on the cheek. But then, the moment he pressed the button, Sadie jumped in and kissed his other cheek. She laughed so much about it, and acted like she was just joking, but I found it really odd. Then, something even more odd happened. I went to her room one night to borrow a book. Her door was open, so I just walked in, and I saw her sitting there cutting the Polaroid photo. Suddenly, everything made sense. She was obviously in love with Jordan and wanted to come between us. That's why she always turned up to ruin the moment and why she kissed his cheek. But the thing that hurt the most was that she wanted to cut me out of the photo. I'd been so good to her, like a sister, and never wanted her to feel left out. But the whole time, she'd been looking to get rid of me. That day, we had a huge fight, and I told her I couldn't believe she'd want to ruin my relationship with Jordan like this. She just stood there crying, saying she was sorry, and she couldn't help how she felt. After that, she just disappeared. I felt kind of guilty. I'd been so angry at her. But why did she have to drop out of university because of it? If only I'd been more calm about it all, maybe we'd still be friends. Jordan and I stayed together, which helped a lot. At least I still had him. In my third year of university, I won an award for my successful research on a biochemical compound, and I got to give presentations in hospitals. One time, I was at a hospital in San Fran, and I met a guy called David. He'd been sitting in the front row, and I noticed that he seemed to truly focus on my presentation. After I finished, he came up to ask me some questions. He was seriously charming, and it felt great to meet someone who really had interest in my research. After we chatted, he gave me his phone number, and then left. I don't know why, but I couldn't stop thinking about him. Obviously, I didn't tell Jordan about him, and pretty soon, David and I were talking all the time. We had so much in common, and he seemed to understand me more than Jordan did. After one month of talking to David every day, I broke up with Jordan. It wasn't fair on him, and I knew deep down I just wanted to be with David. One day, David and I were out walking, and we bumped into Jordan. Suddenly, Jordan punched David right in the face, and while the two of them were fighting, David's wallet fell out of his pocket, and straight away, I saw something familiar. It was the Polaroid photo! And then, I looked closer, and realized it was a photo of me and Sadie. I hadn't been cut out of it. Jordan had been. It looked like Sadie and I were kissing in the photo. But why did David have this in his wallet? I showed it to Jordan, and we were both so confused. And that's when David broke down and told us everything. David is Sadie! She'd undergone surgeries to change her gender and her appearance because she was so in love with me and just wanted to find a way for us to be together. I was so shocked. I mean, I love David, but I'd never thought about being with a trans guy before. I don't know what to do. Should I continue dating David? Even though he lied to me about everything? Hey guys, I want to tell you about my most memorable summer. It involves a parent-free house, the girl of my dreams, and my little bro Silas's massive secret. Actually, Silas doesn't want me telling you about it. But this story is too fun to keep it for ourselves. So stay tuned. Let me tell you what happened. Imagine the scene. I'm there eating corn dogs when my parents announce they're going away on vacation for their 20th wedding anniversary. 
That means I'll be home alone all week long in our big farmhouse surrounded by vast fields. Sounds great, right? But wait, it got even better when my childhood friends who had now lived in another city were also back in town for the summer vacation. Of course, my parents let me invite them over to stay while they are away. That's how close our families were. Oh God, I haven't seen Carl in over a year. And his sister, Ellie, too. Yep, I wouldn't say that I had the biggest crush on my best friend's sister, but there's that. Anyway, this was going to be my summer paradise. But you know, man proposes, God disposes. It turns out my parents weren't taking Silas with them. Because they thought I was old enough to look after my little brother. Ugh, what a bummer. How was I meant to impress Ellie when I had a whining kid to care for? I needed to think fast. So as soon as we waved our parents off, I passed my PS4 to him and said, Silas, you can play on it, but only if you promise to do as I ask and stay out of my way. Of course, he agreed. I mean, what eight-year-old boy wouldn't want to play Fortnite? I checked on him now and then and gave him juice and snacks. Other than that, I had plenty of time to spend hanging out with Carl and Ellie. Things were going well for the first few days. And nothing beats being around your best bud and your crush all day long. Whoa, <laughs> just... I just couldn't take my eyes off Ellie. She seemed to have gotten even more beautiful. Then, on one evening, we were sitting outside, stargazing. It was so romantic. Especially when Carl thought it was dull and left us to go to bed first. I was about to do the whole yawn and stretch out my arm to wrap around her shoulders trick when Silas appeared and squeezed in between us. I glared at him and through gritted teeth asked him what he wanted. He just shrugged and said, Edward, I'm bored of that game now. I want ice cream. Ellie laughed, then led him off to get some. What? How dare that little dweeb ruin my smooth moves? What a buzzkill! I needed to come up with a new trick to handle this annoying kid. So, the next morning, I told Silas that if he wanted to download a new game of his choice, he needed to go into the field and find a corn cob with exactly 200 seeds on it. He looked like he was going to cry, but he went off to the field. Oh, how smart I am, sending my little brother on a wild goose chase. I expected him to give up after a few hours, but nope. He was out there searching for it all day. He even managed to drag Carl along to help him. In the end, he still had to leave empty-handed. Anyway, I have to thank my stupid brother for helping me to have such a good afternoon with Ellie. That night, we all sat together in the living room and told creepy ghost stories. I hoped Ellie would freak out so much she nestled into my lap for protection. So I told him about the empty house up the road, which was also our family's property. My grandparents used to live there, but now it had been abandoned for over 40 years. There were plenty of rumors about it being haunted. One farmer said he saw a ghostly woman by the window, but she vanished into thin air. And someone else said they saw a spooky figure float out of the house and chase after them. Ellie chuckled then said, Ooh, spooky. We should go and check it out. What? This wasn't what I had in mind. In fact, she didn't seem afraid at all. I didn't want to go in there. It was old and creepy, and just thinking about it freaked me out. Luckily for me, Silas strongly discouraged us by saying that he had heard someone crying in that house, and our parents didn't allow us to go there. And then, from nowhere, I felt the chilly wind blow over me with a whistle, which made my hair stand on end. And boom! The lights went out, leaving the whole room in darkness. Everyone was confused. What on earth was going on? I didn't want to die now, not when I haven't even told my crush my feelings yet. I was lost in terrifying thoughts when the lights came back on, and everyone else immediately bursted out laughing. OMG, I found myself sitting on Ellie's lap with my head between my hands. It turns out that my evil little brother was the one who turned the lights off as a prank. How humiliating. Oh well, at least Ellie changed her mind about wanting to check the house out. But then, over the next few days, weird things started happening. I went to grab a snack for my secret loot under my bed, but what's this? All of the Snickers bars had gone. It couldn't have been Silas, as he hated Snickers bars, right? Then we were watching a movie. Ellie started shivering, so being the awesome guy I am, I went to get a blanket for her, but... Huh? All of the blankets had gone? When I went back and told Carl and Ellie about it, Ellie said that was odd, as the other day she couldn't find her pajamas, and Carl's pack of Gatorade had vanished too, so... Is there a real ghost in my house? As for my bro, he was acting like he was haunted. He barely talked anymore, and for three days in a row, at 6 p.m. on the dot, he disappeared out of the house for hours. This was so strange, I mean, that's the time slot for his favorite show. 
and he seriously wouldn't miss Adventure Time without a good reason. For me, it's great that Silas isn't at home, but since I'm the older brother, I still have to keep an eye on him, as mom and dad wouldn't have been best impressed if I'd lost him or something. That night, he mysteriously disappeared again. I was quite curious, so I went to look for Silas but couldn't find him anywhere. Panicked, I raced around the garden calling out his name. Finally, I felt a hand pounding on my shoulder. My heart was in my mouth. I turned around to see Silas standing there sweating. I shouted at him, You can't just run off without saying a word! Where have you been? But Silas calmly replied, So what? It's my business, not yours. Then he ran straight inside. He gotta be kidding me. Okay, then if secrecy was the game he wanted to play, then I wouldn't mind being the detective either. I had to figure this out. So I gathered Ellie and Carl and came up with a genius plan. The next day at lunch, as planned, Silas entered the kitchen and everything was set. I placed an eye-catching candy-filled jar on the table, and as expected, Silas immediately picked up a handful and put them right in his mouth. Oh, just look at his happy face. He had no idea what I had in store for him. Right after that, we entered the room. Not wanting to get caught eating food on the sly, Silas quickly hid under the table. And of course, we pretended not to know he was there. Then I held up that candy jar and said, Guys, guess what? I've ordered these pills online. It's the legendary invisible candy that makes it impossible for people to see me. Carl acted surprised. Unbelievable! How did you get this? I heard it's such a hit that it was sold out everywhere. Then Ellie asked me how long we could disappear if we ate these candies. I replied, I think if we just eat four to five candies, we can disappear for 45 minutes. We continued our skit. Then I said I had to leave the candy jar here. So tomorrow we can try it and go out pranking everyone with our new superpower. I winked and everyone nodded. Now, where did Silas go again? I asked and everyone shook their heads. Then I picked up an apple and purposely dropped it on the floor. Then immediately peered underneath the table to look for it while pretending not to see Silas down there. He looked absolutely amazed, trying not to make any sound. Now Silas thought he was truly invisible. He crawled out then did all sorts of funny things in front of us, from dancing, shaking his butt, and cartwheeling across the room. It was so hard to keep a straight face and ignore his existence. Then, at 6 p.m., Silas left the house with a backpack on. But because he thought he was invisible, he ran straight past us without hesitation and didn't forget to stick his tongue out at me before leaving. Hm, this idiot. We followed him, and guess what? He went to the abandoned house. We hid behind a tree to watch, and suddenly the door creaked open. I was a little creeped out, so I clung to Ellie's arm. Someone ran over to him. A little girl. Oh no, was it a, g a, g a ghost? Ellie said, OMG, she's in my clothes! I looked closer and realized she wasn't a ghost, but in fact, was a real-life girl. So Silas hid that little girl in our abandoned house, and that's why he kept telling us over and over again not to come here. Since Silas thought that he was invisible, he kept running around her saying, You can't see me, right? He looked so funny as the little girl was too bewildered to understand anything. And right then we barged in shouting, Gotcha! Well, well, well. Look who's the big guy hiding his girlfriend here. I pulled out Silas's backpack, which was filled with Snickers bars and other missing items. Silas was shocked and sputtered, I, it's, uh, uh, it's not what you think. The little girl burst into tears and said, I'm Sally. I got lost, so Silas helped me. Silas said that he had met Sally one day on the cornfield. She was alone and hungry, so he brought her here and took care of her. He didn't dare tell us because he was afraid that we would make fun of him. Oh, I didn't think that my usual foolish brother was able to do such a good thing. So I hugged them and said, I don't blame anyone, Silas. You did a very good job, and Sally, you will be safe here. Take her to our house and I will call someone for help. Fortunately, the police said that they were also looking for a missing child, and the next day, Sally was reunited with her parents. It turned out she was at a crowded train station when she ended up lost. Confused, she followed a man with the same shirt as her father, and that's how she ended up lost in our fields. Yeah, my brother is a bit annoying at times, but he's a good kid, with a kind heart. Since then, we've grown closer. Hi everyone. Have you ever had someone get revenge on you? It's not fun, right? Well, this is my story about revenge, but with a twist. You won't believe who my prankster turned out to be. Oh, let me introduce myself. I'm Audrey, and I'm 24. 
To say I've had an unhappy life would be an understatement. Firstly, my dad ditched my mom for another woman. And not long after that, my mom passed away from a serious illness. Basically, my entire life fell apart in a matter of months, and I was still too young at that time. It was tough growing up, and I always think that my life could never turn the page again. But on one fine day, someone popped into my life and changed everything. His name was Jim, and he was seven years older than me, and he seriously turned my life around. He lived in another city, but he often came to my city on business trips. We fell for each other quickly. That happiness didn't last long, though. One day I was working in the clothes store when a girl around the same age as me came in. She wanted my help to choose some dress, but she was pretty rude to me and I kept catching her staring at me with evil eyes. Who was she? And why was she treating me like that? Finally, after about two hours, she made up her mind and picked up only a tie that she wanted to buy for her husband instead. I was relieved to get rid of her, but shocked when I saw the name on her credit card. Jim Stewart. Her husband had the exact same name as my boyfriend. What a coincidence. She must have caught me staring at the card because she suddenly said, Yes, Jim is my husband. Now stay away from him. What? Her husband? My Jim. Before I even had a chance to react, she turned to everyone in the store and said, This girl is a gold digger, and she's trying to break up my marriage. I was shocked. I tried to explain that it wasn't true, but she wouldn't listen to me. She just stormed out, and I was left standing there hearing people whispering about me. It was the most humiliating moment of my life. I immediately ran to the staff room and called Jim. I was really hoping it had all been a big misunderstanding, but I could tell from Jim's tone that it was the truth. He told me he'd lied to me, and that he actually lived in the same city. He just made up the business trip stuff so he wouldn't have to see me often. Then he said, Audrey, I honestly love you. I'm serious about us. Hang on, was he for real? It was ridiculous. I was disgusted by him. How could he treat me like that? I hung up and felt horrified. It brought back horrible memories of the woman who stole my dad away from my mom. I didn't want to be that woman. The next day, I moved out of the house Jim had rented for me. I didn't want to be associated with that loser anymore. But life works in mysterious ways. The day I moved into my new house, I saw Jim's wife. And you won't believe it. It seemed that she just moved in next door too. Was this some kind of joke? As soon as she saw me, she smirked and said, Wow, what a coincidence. Hello, neighbor. I'm Linda. Seeing her unpacking her stuff all by herself, I couldn't help but wonder where Jim was. But then I thought maybe Linda had ended things with him and had moved here alone. I hope so anyways. I'd hate to have Jim as a neighbor. So that's when my new life began. And it has been crazy ever since. From that first week of living there, Linda started pranking me. It all began with her throwing trash into my yard. I even caught her doing it and she just grinned and said, Oops, my hand slipped. Then she walked away laughing. It made me furious. And that was just the beginning. One weekend, a delivery guy rocked up on my porch with 10 extra large pizzas. I tried to explain I hadn't ordered them. And that's when Linda appeared at my door and said, Oh, thanks for ordering me dinner, Audrey. I'm starving. Then she grabbed five of the pizzas and ran to her house, leaving me there with a bill of $100. Jeez, it was so annoying. And I had no option but to pay. Linda was too much. Seriously. As much as her pranks drove me up the wall, I also felt sorry for her. I knew what it was like to have someone you love stolen away from you. She must have hated me so much for ruining her marriage even though it hadn't been my fault. I decided to just put up with her pranks. She'd get over it eventually, and it's not like they were harming me, right? Well, one night I heard the doorbell. I wasn't expecting anyone and was surprised to see a young guy standing there with a poster that said, I agree to be your boyfriend. Come out with me. I was totally puzzled and told him he had the wrong house, but then he showed me the address on the other side. It was my address. What on earth? I told him I wasn't interested, but he tried to grab my hand and said, Come on, girl, don't be shy. I told him if he didn't leave me alone, I'd call the police. So luckily, he ran away. Needless to ask, I knew for sure that was Linda's joke. But this time, she had taken it too far. I decided to go over and have a word with her once and for all. As I was walking to her house, I saw someone familiar on the other side of the road. I couldn't believe it. It was my dad? So many years had passed, and he'd completely changed. But there was no doubt it was him. I suddenly blurted out, Dad? But I didn't know what to do next. 
I was just thinking about my next move when I felt someone behind me. I turned around and saw Linda. She just smirked at me and walked away. What was her problem? Did she hear what I just said? I was so shocked at seeing my dad, I ran back into my house. I hated him for what he'd done to my mom. But he was still my dad, and I wanted to know if he was okay and what he was doing here. I barely slept that night as I couldn't stop thinking about my dad. The next morning, I was sitting by the window when he appeared again. This time, he was with Linda, and she was holding his arm. What was she doing with my dad? Why were they so close? Later that day, I saw him again, and this time, he and Linda were hugging. OMG, were they dating? Maybe Linda had heard me call him dad, and now she was flirting with him to truly get revenge on me. This was too much. The thought of Linda as a stepmom made me want to puke. I waited and waited, but he was inside her house and there was no sign of him leaving. Eventually he left and as soon as he was in his car, I ran over to her house. I was shaking as I knocked on the door and as Linda opened it, I said, You are way too much. Can you just stop with the revenge already? Linda looked confused and said, What the heck are you talking about? Linda still didn't seem to get it. And I was about to explain when I heard footsteps. I turned around and my dad was right there. He said, What's the matter, Linda? Why are you fighting with this stranger? Huh? Stranger? Didn't he recognize me? Then Linda butted in and said, It's okay, Dad. We're just having a misunderstanding here. What? Dad? Is he your dad? Really? I stammered. Yeah, why? What's the matter? He said, Linda, you don't need to lie to me. I know you're dating my dad to get revenge on me. I continued. Whoa, hold on. What do you mean your dad? Linda gasped. At that, my dad looked confused too and walked to me and asked if he could look at my hand. After seeing my birthmark, he started crying and hugging me. Audrey, it's you. It's really you. I didn't know how to react, so I just let him hug me. It had been so long since anyone had held me like this. Ever since my mom had died, I'd tried to be strong and keep it together, but suddenly I couldn't hold back anymore. I burst into tears in his arms. We stood like that for a long time, and eventually he took me into Linda's house and told me the story. It turned out, after he left me and my mom, he got tricked by that woman, and he was so ashamed, he decided to move to another city and start over. He was working hard on a construction site one day when he got injured, so he ended up in hospital. And that's when he met Linda. She'd been in a car accident and needed a blood transfusion urgently. She has a pretty rare blood type, but luckily my dad had the same type and he volunteered to give her a transfusion. After that, they became quite close, and seeing as Linda had lost both her parents in the car accident, my dad eventually adopted her. I couldn't believe it. My dad had been through so much, and this whole time, I thought he was off living his life with a rich woman. I felt so bad for him and decided to leave the past behind and forgive him. As for Linda, she was also left confused by this coincidence, so she left the room to process everything, while I and Dad took time to catch up on our lives. Later, Linda prepared dinner for us three, and before we digged in, she shyly grabbed my hand and said, Audrey, I've been so awful to you. I'm sorry. I know you aren't the one responsible for my divorce, but I still felt upset, and that's why I played all those pranks. That was so childish, right? Please forgive me. Sister, we laughed it off, then hugged each other to make peace. I couldn't believe it. After all these years of being lonely, suddenly I had a sister, and my dad was back. My life had finally turned a corner, and I almost laughed at the thought that it was all because of meeting Jim. At least one good thing had come out of that disastrous relationship. My name is Oscar, and I've been madly in love with Leanna since I was 19. I met her at college and was instantly smitten by her beautiful smile and her dazzling personality. She had this amazing aura about her. When she was around then, however bad my day had been, everything just felt good. I didn't tell Leanna how I felt about her because she had a boyfriend, Tony, who also just so happened to be my housemate. Leanna loved Tony, and he loved her, so I kept my feelings to myself. I knew that I'd have to make do with having Leanna in my life just as a friend. I finished college started a new job, and things were going pretty well. I was still in love with Leanna, but I'd learned to accept the fact that she was happy with Tony, and I was pleased for them both. Then one day I got a frantic call from Leanna saying that she'd been driving and they'd been in an accident. Tony was dead. The accident hadn't been Leanna's fault. The roads had been icy, and the car had skidded into a brick wall. 
Leanna found it difficult to get past the guilt. She wasn't this full-of-life person anymore. Instead, she just seemed so lost and sad. I started spending more time with her. I took her out to restaurants, the bowling alley, and mini-golf. These were the types of things we all used to go with Tony, but I wanted her to realize that she could still live her life and enjoy it even though Tony wasn't here anymore. When Leanna was around at my house and we were watching Tony's favorite film together, she was crying, and I was trying my best to comfort her. I just wanted to take all the pain away from her. Before I could stop myself, I blurted out the words, Leanna, I love you. She looked stunned. I'd said them now and I knew it was too late to take them back. I'm sorry, I know I shouldn't have told you that. You're grieving for Tony and, well, I know you see me as a friend, but I truly love you, Leanna, and always have. I want you to realize that the accident wasn't your fault and find happiness in life. As you're a beautiful person inside and out and Tony would want you to live an amazing and happy-filled life because he loved you. She burst into tears and hugged me. We both stayed like that, huddled on the couch, crying for hours. Finally, she pulled apart from me. She told me that I was an amazing person, but it was all too much for her, and she needed space. How about if we're both still single at 30, then we'll get married? She asked me. At first, I didn't think that she was being serious, but I loved her so much, and I believed that agreeing to this would comfort her. So there it was. If by 30, Leanna had learned to heal, and neither of us had fallen in love with someone else, then we'd get married. After this, we parted ways. Leanna moved to another town, and I moved countries. For the first couple of years, we didn't talk at all. Then out of the blue, Leanna sent me a message on social media. We started chatting more regularly, and then we became strong friends again. Talking to Leanna resurfaced all of the feelings I felt for her, and my love for her grew stronger than ever. When we were both age 29, we were chatting on the phone, and I jokingly mentioned the marriage pact. She suddenly fell silent, and at first, I was worried I'd upset her. Still, I knew that I needed to tell her how I felt. Leanna, I still feel the same way about you. I don't love anyone else. I love you. More silence. I thought I'd done it this time, but I didn't regret telling her how I felt. I haven't fallen in love with anyone else either, she eventually said. Let's spend some time together and see if the spark's still there. I wanted to shout yes, but I tried to keep my cool. At this point, we were both living in the same city, so we arranged to meet up at the weekend. The spark was most definitely still there. We started dating and it was amazing. I finally had the girl of my dreams, and I'd never been happier. A few months later, we were walking through the park after a romantic meal, and I got down on one knee and proposed to her. She smiled at me and said, Not fair. I'm not 30 yet. You'll have to put that away for two more months, then ask me again then. I thought it was silly, but it was reasons like that that made me love her even more. She always honored her word. I planned a surprise 30th birthday for her in her favorite restaurant. I invited all of her friends and family, and I planned on proposing to her. I was waiting for her in the restaurant. Her friend was meant to bring her, but they were late. I rang her friend up and asked her where they were. Her friend started crying and told me that Leanna had been crossing the road, and a car had hit her. She was at the hospital. Leanna was in intensive care. I left the party without saying a word to anyone and raced to the hospital. Leanna was in a coma for two days. I stayed there and held her hand for the entire time. There was nothing left they could do for her, and she died. I'd finally got my soulmate, and now I'd lost her. I fell into a state of depression and lost my job, my home, everything. I moved back in with my parents and had to start again. I'm currently in therapy to try and rebuild my life. It's not easy, as most of the time, all I feel is empty. It's been four years since then, and I still miss her every day. It's hard, but I've learned to live with the pain and loss of the life we'll never lead. Thank you for listening to my story. Some love journeys are never meant to be, and as painful as this is, we have to find the strength and will inside of ourselves not to give up on life. I'm trying my best to be strong and to live out my life as well as I possibly can, as I know that this is what Leanna would have wanted. Have you ever met someone and known instantly that they are the one for you? I wish I'd realized sooner so that my teenage years hadn't been so full of drama and heartbreak. But you live and learn, right? And better late than never. By the way, I'm Versalise, and I'm 24 years old. It all began 14 years ago when I moved to New York and started at a new school. At that time, I assumed that moving from my hometown in France to New York would be no big deal. 
My mom and I were super excited and truly believed it would change our lives. Indeed, it did, but not in the ways I ever expected. On my first day at my new school, my mother insisted on driving me to school. When we arrived, I gave my mom a kiss on both of her cheeks and waved goodbye. My mom joked that she'd sort out any of the kids who dared to mess with me. I did feel quite shy, but I thought she was just joking. Turns out she wasn't. At lunchtime, I sat down at a random table, and suddenly this girl appeared and said, What do you think you're playing at, sitting at our table? I didn't even have time to reply before she picked up my lunch tray and threw it off the table right into the trash can. I said, Move, she said. Everyone was staring at us now. I was so upset, I just covered my face. I didn't want to be that crybaby in front of all these new people, but I couldn't help it. The tears started falling. Then something crazy happened. A voice boomed out through the cafeteria, saying, Get away from her! And then the next moment, I felt a hand reach out for my hand, and when I looked up, this gorgeous tall boy was standing there looking at me when he picked me up on my feet. Excuse me, the girl started, but the boy continued, What is wrong with you? Do you have a screw loose or something? Your attitude is so gross. It'll make me puke. You disgust me, and I don't want to be friends with someone like you. She stood there with her mouth wide open as he grabbed my hand and walked away. I could hear her scoff from behind me, but her facial expression looked as if she'd lost. I took his hand and followed him out of the cafeteria, and that's when he introduced himself as Ryder. We sat down outside, and he asked me if I was new around here, and then he told me he loved my accent. And he even offered me half of his baguette and said, Hey, come on, chin up. I'll be your friend, okay? The best part is that the girl who bullied me had a major crush on him, so she was probably even angrier at me now. But I didn't care one bit. After that, I can't remember a time when we were apart. We were glued at the hip and did everything together. He taught me how to skateboard, and I taught him how to bake my famous pastries. We were like the dream team. He made me laugh so much, and he helped me become more confident. Day by day, I could tell I wanted to be more than just his friend, but I didn't dare tell him that. Then my 12th birthday rolled around, and my mom gave me a diary. She told me to write down all of my thoughts, and even my crushes so that I could reflect back on it one day. Then she winked at me and walked away. Ew, what was she talking about? I didn't have a crush. Did I? Okay, who am I kidding? I had the biggest crush ever on Ryder. Every time I saw him, I felt like there were a million butterflies in my stomach, and I woke up excited every day because I knew I'd get to see him. And then the time came for our school dance, and my friends were teasing me that I should go with Ryder. I kept telling them he was just my friend, but I couldn't fool them. They saw right through me. Later that day, Ryder invited me over to play video games, and as we were playing, he said, Hey, um, want to go to the dance with me? I couldn't believe it. My heart was thumping in my chest, but I tried to play it cool and said, Uh, sure, I guess. And you know what? We had the best time ever at the dance. I was for sure on cloud nine, and afterwards I decided to journal about it in my diary. I never wanted to forget that night. So I wrote pages upon pages of how Ryder made me feel and how I loved him so much. Little did I know how everything was about to change. A few days later, Ryder came over to my house, and as soon as I saw him, I had the biggest grin on my face. But quickly that grin faded when Ryder said he had something to tell me. I have some bad news. My family and I are moving to London in a month. This is a joke, right? Come on, stop playing around. I said, trying to hide the worry in my voice, but he just stayed quiet, and by then I knew he wasn't joking. I couldn't hold back the tears, and Ryder just reached out and held me in his arms, comforting me. He told me it would be okay, and we'd still keep in touch, but I felt like my whole world was crumbling around me. This was the worst news of my life. We decided to make our last month together the most fun we'd ever had. We went surfing, skateboarding, stargazing, and even did karaoke. I never wanted that month to end, but of course it did.
On our last night together, we had a slumber party and stayed up all night waiting for the sun to rise. When it came time to say goodbye, he gave me a framed photo of the two of us and said if I ever felt sad, I could just look at it and remember the happy times. I wanted to tell him how I felt, but I couldn't, and so he left. I was so down that I ran upstairs and covered myself under the blanket and cried. Later that night, as usual, I was about to write my day in my diary when it was nowhere to be seen. I shouted at my mom and blamed her, but she just said I must have misplaced it. Now I had no writer and no diary. My life sucked. Summer quickly ended and it was time for high school. Even though I had my friends, my life wasn't the same without Ryder. But life goes on, and so eventually I tried to move on from Ryder. My friends told me that this guy Lucas had always had a crush on me, and maybe I should give him a chance. Well, soon we started dating, and even though I didn't have the same special connection with him as I had with Ryder, it was still fun, and it took my mind off of things.